Okay, Keith, we're ready to go. Okay. Call, the more, uh, call to order. Roll call, please. Brian Card. Here, virtually. Vanga Lawrence. Here, really. John Sarantopoulos. Here. Matthew Wendar. Here. And Keith Thurlow. Present. Uh, no alternates to sit. Um, any addendums? No, no addendums. Uh, you want to go over to our citizens' comments? Any? You want to read that whole thing? Or? I'll read it. Citizen okay. comments on items not subject to public hearing. Individual presentations not to exceed three minutes, limited to an aggregate of 21 minutes unless otherwise indicated by a majority vote of the commission. Note, public comments can be emailed to public comment at killingleyct.gov or mailed to the town of Killingly, 172 Main Street, Killingly, Connecticut, 06239, on or before the meeting. All public comment must be received prior to 2 p.m. the day of the meeting. Public comment received will be posted to the town's website, www.killingly, it should say killinglyct.gov, and then Note to participate in citizen comments, the public may join the meeting via telephone while viewing the meeting on Facebook Live. To join by phone, please dial 1-415-655-0001 and use the access code 2630-941-0114 when prompted. Okay, thank you, Emory. Um, Anybody, citizens' comments <clears throat> to anything not related to any of the public hearings tonight? Does anybody want to speak to anything not related? No. I take that means no? I think so. Okay, public hearings. Special permit application number 21-1273, David Cody, Frito Lay Landowner, 1886 Upper Maple Street, GIS Map 62. Lot 5394 acres, industrial zone for proposed building addition that would exceed the maximum height of 50 feet of said zone with a proposed height of 86 feet, eight and a half inches. Um, I'm seeing from the back the attorney. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Joseph Hammer from the law firm of Dave Pitney for the applicant, Frito Lay. Uh, would you like me to go ahead? Yes, and just introduce who's sitting next to you. Just Sure. I can't see. David Cody of Haskell is right next to me. Um, Thank you, sir. So as you, as you all know, members of the commission, tonight is the third meeting at which you've considered the special permit and the site plan. Um, we know you have a full agenda tonight. Our goal is to provide some additional information and responses um, from the last meeting in a brief presentation. And um, we are hopeful that we can complete the proceedings on both applications this evening. Um, before I start, I want to note that the third party engineering review comments that the commission obtained from CLE Engineering in a letter dated January 12th uh, were provided to us and Haskell has submitted a written response to those that's dated January 14th that I think you should have. Um, certainly if there's Questions as we get into this would be happy to address them, but we're we're, we're not going to uh, you know present specifically on that unless there's questions. Um, secondly, um, I wanted to note that zoning staff uh, provided a copy to us of a 2011 planting plan that it located um, in their files after the last meeting. Um, Frito Lay prepared slides showing photos uh, of existing conditions. Uh, which show um, that there were uh, plantings um, implemented by Frito-Lay um, consistent with that plan. We submitted those on Friday, January 14th, and if there's any questions on those, we'd be more than happy to answer them. But turning um, to our presentation, uh, I'm going to, in, in a second, turn it to Haskell, and they're going to go over some um, modifications to the employee and trailer parking that are in response to comments we received, give you a little more detail on the auto parking 
relocation, which was presented conceptually at the last meeting. Um, and as I say, if there's any questions on the third party, we can uh, handle them as well. Scott Hesketh, the traffic engineer, I think was really asked one uh, question at the last meeting, which he'll respond to. And then Bennett Brooks, the sound expert, um, is going to review sound uh, modeling that he did of the future rooftop equipment that'll be installed on the AS RS uh, warehouse expansion. I think there were some questions from a couple of commission members on that one last time. So that's in response to that. Um, and then at the very end, um, again, if there's public comment, I, you know, I guess after we're towards the end of, of all of the people who are speaking, I will have some uh, concluding comments, want to talk about the regulation, some aspects of the application, and uh, some potential possible conditions of approval. And I will also respond to the uh, environmental petitions that were filed by the Lake Association. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Cody, who I think is going to turn it over to Stephen Cole. Yes, thank you. This is David Cody. And Stephen Cole, are you on, please? I am on and should be presenting. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you and see you. Please do an introduction and go ahead and get started. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, so good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Stephen Cole. I'm the civil engineer on the project and have uh, talked to uh, the board a couple of previous times. So uh, here tonight, I'm going to be submitting or um, reviewing five or six revised uh, designs specifically around the auto parking lot and the 900 uh, 15 trailer spaces and those revisions. Uh, we submitted 26 drawings with revised design, uh, but I'll hone in on these five or six sheets here this evening. So you should see on the screen an overall site plan. Uh, once again, north is to the right, upper Maple Street is on the top of the page. The auto parking lot, the revised design, uh, nets 172 added spaces to the site. And <clears throat> This uh, revised layout um, also has a 289 foot uh, separation distance from Upper Maple Street right of way to the closest point on the auto parking lot. The existing auto parking lot has a buffer space uh, offset distance of 271 feet. Um, so we are exceeding the existing uh, buffer area between the right of way and parking lot improvements. Moving to the south, the 15 trailer spaces, um, there was a reduction in the number of spaces there. Uh, we've gone to an, an angled uh, approach. We are meeting the 25 foot required buffer space uh, per section 430.2.5 as well. Also the site, uh, we meet all required setbacks per table A for the industrial classification. Also on this plan, you'll note um, we are restriping existing ADA spaces to be compliant with the state of Connecticut handicap space detail. Moving on, this is the enlarged geometry plan for the 15 trailer spaces on the south side of the uh, site. Also is enlarged uh, detail of the ADA spaces. Like I previously said, we're meeting the 25 foot required setback. Uh, currently, this matches the gallon lot trailer park install back of curb um, alignment. We currently have 28 feet with a six foot shoulder and proposed fence. And later on uh, in the presentation, I do have some landscaping plans, so I'll present those as well. Uh, these improvements, one change is uh, paving the drive. So uh, this extends off of the existing gravel drive. We will be improving that uh, for uh, tractor trailer traffic. Um, I do want to go back once again to the overall site plan. Um, this existing gravel road will remain undisturbed except for uh, paving improvements at the south end. This will remain open. <clears throat> Next sheet is the enlarged geometry plan for the employee auto lot. The areas you see here that are hatched are uh, hatched for snow storage. Um, like I said previously, this is a net add of 172 spaces. It will have a sidewalk connection to the existing employee auto lot on the south side. 
And as previously stated, this dimension from Upper Maple Street to the closest point of pavement is 289 feet. The fencing that we're showing will be routed in a manner as to not disturb any trees um, and will really be a field uh, layout there. Steven, are you still there? Yep, sorry, I was flipping sheets here. So I wanted to move on to the landscaping plan uh, for the trailer lots. Uh, the plan is to have staggered white spruces and red cedars along the back of curb uh, within that 28 foot uh, offset from the property line to the back of the trailer stalls. Uh, one of our goals here was to maintain some of the existing berms. You can see by the contours here, this is a, a vegetated berm with plantings. We're not encroaching on that. Um, existing grades along the drive will be maintained. Um, and this uh, trailer lot is actually down at uh, grade level existing grade. So minimal uh, earthwork would be required and uh, in order to promote this flow through traffic from the southern lot. Moving into the auto parking lot. Similarly, um, we are looking to add white cedars or white spruce and red cedars along um, this embankment. So the, the plan and what there's a lot of analysis that was done on the elevation specifically for this auto parking lot. Um, currently, what we're showing at this location is around an 11 foot berm um, to match existing. So this will tie into the existing parking lot as we transition north this uh, four foot berm four foot height berm above the existing or proposed auto parking lot will be planted. So um, that four foot berm extends around the perimeter of the auto parking lot around to the existing drive. And that uh, really was decided on the, the least impact one to trees in the existing terrain, as well as to provide adequate screening uh, with that four foot berm so as to limit line of sight to the auto parking lot. Also a uh, cut fill analysis uh, was kind of determined on this to uh, really limit the export material. Also on this sheet, we're showing uh, 500, uh, 5,500 square feet of provided uh, landscape here. Uh, the requirement for the Town of Killingly ordinance is 5,360 square feet of green space. Uh, we're providing that on the perimeter of the parking lot as well. Uh, that pretty much takes me through some of the major changes. Uh, I will be on the call to address any comments or questions from uh, board members from here. Hand it back to you, Dave. Yep. Uh, thank you, Stephen. So if if there aren't any questions for uh, Mr. Cole, we can move on to the next uh, speaker. If Excuse you'd like me. Us. Excuse yep. me. Uh, Mr. Cole, you were talking about the minimal cut and fill. And um, can you re respond? To, is that your response to the concern that was brought up by CLA engineers? That, there no, is that, that isn't necessarily a response specifically to like the export. I think that's the question you're getting at. My analysis is to really limit, obviously we don't want to cut too much into that hillside, but we need to in order to provide the buffer and the berm around the perimeter. So based on the assumption and, and the, the analysis that that four foot berm and planting um, around the perimeter of the parking lot is would be overall beneficial to the project and is uh, a, a good outcome ultimately that's that's really where it came into line so as engineers we look at cut fill look at the grading look at the requirements buffers tying out to existing grade um, we went through a couple different iterations um, and all those iterations actually extended the grading further into this uh, area so this is the least impactful and ultimately suffices the four foot berm and all the planting media do you, do you have numbers on uh, calculations as to how much yardage? I do not at this time. Then do, do you anticipate any uh, actually leaving the site or are you trying to use it all on site? 
Well, obviously we'd like to use all this material that we can on site, um, but we'll have to respond to that at a later date. I think in the CLA comments, uh, we responded that a full cut bill analysis, you know, will, will be performed and transcribed to the engineers. Uh, but at this time, I don't have those volumes. So are you anticipating that you're not completing your information for this night's meeting? Excuse me, did you hear me? Uh, yes, so. Well, you said at a later date, so I'm trying to, trying to anticipate what the expectations might be tonight. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chairman, if I could respond to that, I think at later point in our presentation, um, again, if you look at all those comments, there are a number of uh, items where we're going to provide more information um, and we, are agreeable uh, to impose as a condition of approval um, that all of those items um, be provided. And I have some language that I would propose to that effect. I think this is one of the items that falls into that category. So you, we did our best to respond, you know, quickly to to the uh, to right. the third party review, um, and and some of the items just couldn't physically be, uh, you know, be done by tonight. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I just want to let you know that our third party review engineer is also on WebEx. So if you have a question of him, you can ask him directly. Okay, I'm just going, I, I'm basically inquiring about the, your anticipation of whether everything's going to be submitted tonight or are we expecting another meeting? Uh, yeah, we're, Mr. Chairman, our hope, I'm sorry. Yes. I was yes. going to say our hope is not to go to another meeting, but we would propose a condition that any of those additional items to the third party reviewer will be submitted prior to the issuance of a building permit. Okay. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes. Just just one one comment on that, and I do have a question as well. But you know, on the cut fill, um, I, I, I again being. Um, my background, I find it hard to believe a cut fill analysis was not performed, but uh, that is something that in our site, you know, our, our zoning rules, we're supposed to know what the quantity is to look at it from a gravel operation potential if a certain amount of material is leaving the site. So that, that should be something that's given to the commission for part of its decision making process, not, you know, something that will be followed up to staff at a later date. Um, and then I have one question on your um, landscaping. Uh, Mr. Cole, you kind of talked about the landscaping that would be done from a minimal standpoint. I know one of our meetings passed, we talked about one of the prior approvals that was done to Frito-Lay back in 2010 related to the forest management plan. Will anybody be speaking to that aspect of the landscaping and addressing any of the maintenance or um, integration of the buffer that's between the site and the rail yard that was supposedly part of that 2010 approval um, for the forest management plan? Yes, so I'd have to refer that to uh, Joe and Sill. I believe we do have some documents. Okay, so we'll expect to hear that later, correct? Excuse me. Uh, in the packets, I believe, of all the commission members are those slides that I referred to that Sill Quenga of Frito Lay prepared, which speak to the uh, to that prior planting plan. And if you have any questions on that, he's here and, and could could address them. Brian, did you want to address that now or? Yeah, I'm working off of a single screen here, so I'm gonna have to go find that prior thing. But I was just curious whether or not any, in, again, enhancements and maintenance, whether or not you'd be moving forward with a forest management plan um, as was requested back then, or if that's something we need to address from a conditional point of view. And And my my understanding is that those slides show that there you know were definitely items that were installed um, that are shown on that plan. Quite a few items, um, in fact, so that we we think that we've met the uh, the intent of that. And as we sit here now, we're maintaining everything uh, you know that's out there on the west side of the of the gravel drive as well. And and I believe that I'm sorry. 
I was just, uh, I would like to respond, uh, Brian, your comment about a cut fill analysis. So within the full submittal documents, the engineering documents that were um, submitted on the previously, if you look at sheet 2C 222, specifically for the auto parking lot, we do provide um, cut within that auto parking lot. In relation to the CLA comment and expected uh, haul off site and truck generation, uh, we can't speak to that at this time. So you don't have calculations as to estimated volumes of on uh, on site or off site. Uh, not any for off site. Um, we do analyze uh, our proposed surfaces compared to existing. Um, and right now, if, if you the board members have sheet two C two twenty two specific to the auto parking lot. Um, we do have a, a cubic yardage there with a volume of cut at around 19,000 uh, for that specific auto parking lot. Keep and in mind, and what about, I can look to pull that up. This analysis though, does not take into account other areas of the site. It was specifically requested by Dave Cap um, to provide cross sections and those volumes within the auto parking lot. And that's what was provided. Stephen, repeat that sheet number again. Jonathan's going to pull it up. 2C-222. And yes, I, I, do, I do see those cross sections, so thank you. But again, just a general cut fill. Just to now, again, we're, we're to evaluate just the offsite hauling perspective of any volume leaving the site. So. Understood. And yeah, that, that was a comment by CLA, and uh, we are preparing total response. We don't want to send bits and pieces of information, you know, to you guys. So it, a full site analysis will be done and we'll work with our construction team members on uh, trip generation. And uh, we can, I don't want to get necessarily straight into the comment responses, but um, it will be provided. Can you speak to the 19,000 yards that you're expecting just in the, the auto parking? Can you expand on that? So, the, well, that is, I, I mean, is that going? That's I assume that's going off site. Well, is that, well, can is that correct? Site for fill material, we'll use on site, correct? But there's no estimations as to how much of it would be going off site. Yeah, as previously stated, that analysis from all off site is still being performed. What was? Uh, that was a comment from CLA. We responded to that. We don't have it at this time. We do have volumes for these areas, but we're working on compiling all of that information um, into a complete package based on the comments. And those will be provided. So clearly I'm making you repeat yourself and I apologize for that. Oh, no, you're, you're fine. All good questions. Um, if you wanna continue, Mr. Hammer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to call Scott Hesketh, the uh, traffic engineer, to come up and uh, respond to a question that the commission asked him at the last meeting. If you could just identify yourself again. <coughs> Good evening. For the record, my name is Scott Hesketh, licensed engineer, state of Connecticut, the firm of F. A. Hesketh and Associates. Uh, the last hearing, we were asked a question by one of the commissioners regarding the volume of truck traffic to and from the facility and how it will relate to the, uh, or how it would impact the level of service calculations which were provided. In our initial report, we presented the IT trip generation for trucks based on the size of the facility and the number of employees at the facility. And ITE projected a total of 24 truck trips for the existing facility and a total of 34 peak hour truck trips for the expanded facility. After speaking with uh, the operations folks at the Frito-Lay facility, they've informed us that their um, average peak hour volume of truck trips currently is 26 trucks during the peak hour, which is two higher than the ITE had projected. And they're projecting a total of, uh, total average of 40 peak hour trips during the uh, 
under, for the expanded development, which is about six trucks an hour higher than the ITE had projected. Uh, in my opinion, these are similar numbers in terms of a uh, capacity analysis standpoint. So I do not believe that uh, that minor increase in truck traffic would impact the levels of service calculations at the site driveway intersection. Uh, specifically, since we're projecting a levels overall level of service B at the uh, site Attawagon Crossing uh, Road and the site driveway intersection, with a, a westbound level of service C for the for the westbound approach at that location or under the combined traffic volume conditions. So the minor increase in trucks would not significantly impact the results of that analysis and would not change our opinion as to the um, ability of the local roadway network to accommodate this proposed expansion. If you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to address them. Uh, clarity, that's all. Um, um, these truck trips is from your product or is this for construction trips? You know, caused by the construction. <clears throat> this is the operational, uh, uh, post-construction operational uh, uh, operations. Okay, so this is product, that when you're actually talking about product coming in or going out, materials that required for, for your product. All, all trucks entering and exiting during, uh, yes, during uh, okay. normal production, that's correct. Just, try, just trying to be clear, trying Understood. to understand. Okay, continue. Um, I, I think that was really the question posed last time to Mr. Heskiff. If you, if you don't have any further questions for him, I would turn to our next speaker. Do you have any, any idea where any uh, material is going to be going? I know that you, you want to address that later when we address the answers from the questions from CLA. Oh, you mean material that uh, cut material? Earth material, Earth material yeah. Y yeah, I'm, I, I think, I, I don't know the answer to that, but we can see if we can provide you uh, with some more information. And in the meantime, I could, uh, you know, keep going if you'd like. Yes, that's fine. Okay, I, thank you. Um, next on the WebEx is uh, Bennett Brooks, who's the... Uh, acoustics expert who spoke to you at the last meeting and and there was some questions directed by the commission regarding um you know rooftop equipment on the um asrs building so um he's going to explain to you um some uh, modeling uh, that he's done of that building um, with the projected equipment on top of it and as he'll explain um, it wasn't just the portion that will exceed 50 feet in height. He, he modeled the entire addition to the ASRS. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Brooks. And I think he's got some uh, slides that he may want to show during the course of his remarks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening to the commission. Uh, thanks for hearing uh, my testimony. Um, for the record, I'm Bennett Brooks of Brooks Acoustics in Vernon, Connecticut, a licensed engineer in the state of Connecticut. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to share my screen if I may. Uh, are people seeing that? Yes. Yep. Yes. PowerPoint? I am. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would just like to um, answer uh, the question of December 20th on, the, on that meeting uh, about the rooftop units um, on the ASRS. And so I prepared a little uh, summary uh, presentation for you here. Let's see if we can uh, continue. Page down, there we go. Okay, so this is for what we're calling the ASRS. Uh, which stands for Automated Storage and Retrieval System uh, for Product at Frito-Lay. And uh, essentially, um, we uh, did a design for all of the equipment on top of uh, the, the various roofs that uh, make up this, this uh, proposed building. And uh, we modeled uh, that, uh, the sound that is generated by that equipment um, to the west property line and 
and across the uh, right of way of Upper Maple Street and the railroad to the nearest house, the nearest residence. And uh, this model is based on the current design drawings and equipment spe specs that are uh, for the project. Um, just to let you know, there are four different types of, uh, of pieces on top of the roof, rooftop units, RTUs, makeup air units, supply fans and exhaust fans. The rooftop units are essentially uh, directed toward the loading dock areas that make it uh, uh, easier to load and unload the trucks. And the rest of the, uh, the units uh, condition or at least uh, maintain the correct conditions in, um, in the uh, layout of the building. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this building looks like, uh, on the left, uh, well, the gray portion is the existing building. On the left uh, is the north side in this uh, rendering. And you'll see the low bay on the north. Then there's the high bay area in the middle. There's another uh, low bay uh, to the south. And then, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there's a rather narrow uh, area called the passageway. And then you can see the uh, various pieces of equipment on the top there. For example, these yellows are RTUs, the green are supply fans, uh, the makeup air units, and then exhaust fans in blue. Here are a few more views of what that looks like. And uh, viewing from the south to the north in this uh, view. Uh, so uh, essentially, we th that new area is going to uh, sit uh, next to the existing building up on the north side of the property. And so we modeled uh, the sound based on a grid that we created uh, for the building um, to the nearest property line location to the west and then across the right of way to the uh, nearest residence in in that area. Uh, the sound that we modeled, uh, we obtained from the manufacturers, in this case, the basis of design for uh, this equipment. Uh, our, uh, manufacturers are Train and Green Heck, and so they have their lab test data, which we applied in the mathematical model, uh, taking into account uh, these sources, the building, any barriers uh, that may be involved, distance, atmospheric conditions, terrain, and so on, uh, according to the international standards for this type of calculation. Uh, here's a, a cover sheet of just one of the calculations. We actually did 10 of them, and it shows uh, the contributions of the individual units uh, and then the total. Uh, so I can give you the summary of of this study here in this table. And uh, this is also included. I'm not sure if uh, you received, we, we supplied a short report as well. Uh, it's the same table. So there were uh, five different operating conditions um, based on the way that these units are going to uh, work in their control system. Uh, the rooftops and the makeup air units running simultaneously. Uh, then the other conditions include the uh, supply fans and exhaust fans. They, they're somewhat mutually exclusive. The max operating condition would be running the RTUs near the loading docks and then changing the air with the supply fans and the exhaust fans in each building section. They basically run independently. And then since the high bay area was of interest to the commission, we ran a uh, couple of cases for that, which include the exhaust fans. And then when the exhaust fans are not running, you would have the makeup air, so they don't run at the same time. Uh, so uh, at the nearest house on Upper Maple Street, the highest level that we obtained through the model was 39 A-weighted decibels, uh, abbreviated DBA. And uh, at the property line, it was a, a little higher because uh, we're closer to the building. So that was 40. And that's equivalent to a quiet whisper, which I don't think will transmit over here if I try to do it on the, on the um, 
uh, WebEx. And then moving uh, along, we have the, the supply and exhaust fans at 34 dBA at the house. Uh, the max number of units operating, uh, four RTUs, four supply fans, four exhaust fans, 12 units uh, would be 38 decibels. And then for the high bay only, we're looking at uh, 26 and 32. Uh, so um, this is a fairly quiet system, mainly, uh, you know, their quiet units were selected for this uh, project uh, in terms of the equipment selection, but uh, we do have a lot of distance. And uh, so um, let's see if we can get to the next slide. There we go. So we have some conclusions to present to you uh, based on the nighttime sound level limit uh, mandated by the state of Connecticut and their regulations of Connecticut state agencies, Title 22A-69. The limit is 51 dBA during the nighttime hours, uh, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. Since this system could run at any time, that was the uh, criteria that we used for the uh, design. And uh, just to put that in perspective, the 51 dBA is equivalent to a, a quiet, very quiet voice. And uh, this uh, sound level that we're getting from the ASRS uh, max of about 39 at the house uh, is well below the existing background level. And, and not only that, uh, uh, um, it will not significantly increase uh, the existing plant level. Uh, the good news is that uh, no roof walls or or sound screens or parapets will be needed uh, because of the uh, quiet units that we have. Uh, so there's no height increase proposed. And then uh, in terms of what will what people in the neighborhood will hear, they essentially will be perceived uh, as a very quiet or likely not even audible uh, at the residences. So essentially they wouldn't know it was there due to uh, any sound uh, uh, that is uh, generated there. And that is for uh, all the conditions that we modeled. So uh, that is, those are our conclusions. And uh, I, I believe that answers the question that the uh, commission had, and I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Anyone have any questions? Uh, I do, just this is Matt. Wendorf. Yes, um, just as a brief reminder for, I guess, the public, there was testing done prior to this as far as decibel ratings that were taken of the existing facility. Is that correct? It, it would be helpful that if you could just inform everyone what the current operating decibel rating is in comparison to what it would be with these added on, I think. so. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, good question. We did some engineering studies uh, based on the existing configuration. There were recently upgrades made to what's known as the starch recovery system on the uh, south end of the plant or towards the south end of the plant uh, to uh, quiet some of that equipment. And so we did some before and after engineering studies for that. We did not do a, what you might call a, a full compliance uh, study, which uh, would be at the residences because the uh, state of Connecticut uh, uh, mandates that you do it at the residence, uh, including the, the rights of way between the, the sound source and the receiver. So. Uh, it, but we did some estimates uh, based on previous work that we've done with Frito-Lay over the years. Um, and uh, the level that we were getting for the full plant was in the range of uh, 46 to 48, I believe, based on that engineering study. Um, so that's the, you know, we're below the, the 51 at night. I believe that uh, 
the uh, treatment that we did uh, and the starch system was successful in removing some of the sound that uh, uh, people were noticing. And uh, so that gives us a good basis to move forward with the, with the next, uh, next plan. So the existing study that you did, the, de the decibel rating was just higher than what is produced by the units that are on the roof that are, that are going to be up there, is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Then, uh, Mr. Hammer, if you want to continue, or or if you're, um, I would add. Yep, Mr. Chairman, I I think you know again, we're here to answer any questions, but I'm not sure what your plan is. If you are going to have uh, public comment tonight, then I'm thinking um, I might uh, present my sort of second stage of remarks after that, um, if that might make for a more uh, orderly presentation, or, you know, I, I could get into some of that right now. I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to perhaps wait, but I, I can do it either way. I have okay, a question. Is it, your, is it your intent to just to uh, review your responses and the comments that we were provided from CLNA, CLA, or we're just going to leave that and we'll absorb that on our own. Whatever the commission would like. I mean, I, I, I know you have the ability to ask your own engineer questions, and if you know you have questions for us, we we're happy to answer them. There, a lot of those comments, I think, when you look through it, were simple things like you know changing some labels and you know, wording and, and, and just sort of some technical stuff on the regulations, much, you know, much of, excuse me, on the plans, much of which has been done. So uh, we thought, uh, again, we'll do whatever you'd like, Mr. Chairman, but we were just sort of trying to focus on what your questions were and not necessarily repeating every one, because I think some of them are, you know, are, are very minor and closed out. Keith? Yes. John Sarantopoulos has a question. Okay, John. Uh, thank you. What about this uh, statement that was made where there's some sort of a sheen on the water that's being produced by the manufacturing of uh, your facility? Uh, has anyone looked at uh, to see if somehow something's being emitted into the atmosphere or that's settling on the water? I, I thought that there was some I can't remember if there was some testimony by s either Sill or, or Roger on that last time. Roger Giesick, I'm a senior engineer with Frito-Lay. Um, I think that was raised in some of the public comments. Yes. We've not been provided with any evidence of that other than a statement to that effect. So we haven't done any study to that effect. We've addressed, you know, odor issues, noise issues with the uh, with the state, but we're not aware of any evidence that supports that statement. So that's the uh, uh, that's the first time this issue has come before you. Is that correct? The first time it was raised was was at that hearing during the public comment. Yeah, you haven't had any other complaints at the uh, facility over the years that uh, there's a, a residue being produced, or n not to my knowledge, of oil sheen in the lake. No. Okay. This is Joanne. Um, can I ask who that was that was just speaking in response to John Sarantopoulos' question? Roger Giesick with Frito-Lay. Thank you. Anything else, John? No. Good. Thank you. I mean, at some point, if that's really an issue, it would seem like a water test sample being tested would answer that from somebody. Um, I, most of the questions I think you come up with, I obviously the, the gravel fill coming and going, the tra truck traffic and that kind of stuff still concerns me. Um, and the other one is the buffering. Um, I'm, I'm still a little concerned with the buffering because you've got, like I, like I explained in the last, one of the last meetings, a hole basically that 
I again went up the street just to make sure, verify what I was looking at. And when you go up Maple Street headed north, you still look up. I believe it's over the truck uh, where the trains that go in towards the, the truck uh, unloading of the potatoes in that area. And you can see the existing ASRS building quite clearly. And you can see the top 30% of it probably. I'm estimating, but it's hard to kind of gauge when you're driving along. <clears throat> but clearly you can see the, the top section of the building and this new building is going to go up next to it. You're going to see even more. Um, and the, the greenery, you know, what we count on for, for buffers, you know, is low. Um, I, as I understand your slides are showing that there's, you were addressed 10 years ago and you have smaller trees that grow and, you know, trees that were growing and then they're probably about 10, 15 years old now, um, still in a very shallow state, but it seems like that whole buffer should be reinforced. Um, I mean, I would think, you know, Frito-Lay has been a good company, I think in general for the area, I think it would be behoove them to kind of show a, uh, some kind of a buffering in there that would be more permanent to uh, protect the residential area. It's a residential slash recreational area that you're uh, buffering against. Unfortunately, if you were like on the east side of there, you have the highway and there's really nothing to, to bother you on the east side where it is all kinds of buffering. And unfortunately to the west side, you're right on the tracks and, and along the residential recreational area. Mr. You know, and to have a temporary shallow tree line that comes and goes, uh, and especially from what I could see, it would have to be really rather tall trees that would have to be grown or placed to block the existing ASRS building, never mind uh, the new one. So I, I, I kind of think my, my concern is, is providing buffer along at least that area. The rest of the area seems to be generally pretty well covered, but there is that whole section there where uh, that I'm referring to that when you're out on the west side of it, you can clearly see the activities taking place up there. And I would imagine the sounds carry as well at different activities taking going on all the time. I'm um, just wondering if you could respond to that. If there's something else that might be done. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if we if we could hook up um, this laptop, we'd like to, I think in responding to that, uh, Mr. Quenga can show some actual photos of the area that you're talking about, which I think would be helpful. Um, Jonathan. Jonathan, are you able to? If we hook it up, we might lose audio. That's the only issue. If you, uh, is Mr. Cole able to share those? No, but let me do a thumb drive. <laughs> Let me get it from here. Uh, David, if you can yeah, point can me that. to the direction of that PowerPoint, yeah. um, I can present and you guys can speak to it. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be that easy. Yeah. Uh, I just got these at 4.30, okay. so they're on my, my machine. Okay. If you want to put them on a thumb drive, I can present them. It'll take me two seconds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can we get a one-minute break? They're going to request a few minute break because they need to put the slides on a thumb drive and give them to Jonathan so we do not lose our communication capability okay so is there any other questions from commissioners or concerns that they'd like to bring up at this point oh you're taking a break yeah keith uh i got two questions brian so um just to follow brian hold on it's a little noisy down here can everybody please quiet down because brian does want to have a question answered thank you yeah, so, so Mr. Brooks, just want to follow up and make sure in our, our meeting minutes uh, package, I had asked about you for doing follow-up uh, proof testing at the end of construction to validate your model, just to ensure that obviously the results are consistent with what you're modeling to ensure we don't exceed the noise standard. Um, someone had said yes. We just want to verify that that's still something you will, would be doing because it wasn't documented who said yes. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Card, for the question, Bennett Brooks. Uh, for the record, um, 
We've been engaged by Frito-Lay to conduct that follow-up testing that you had uh, referenced. Uh, so that is in the plan. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to verify that. Um, and then just for the civil engineer, um, one follow-up question as well on the test pits. Question came up on test pits to verify bedrock slash groundwater. You said that would be done at a later date to verify it. Um, is if bedrock is encountered, and this goes back to our gravel regs 560, um, what's the method to remove that bedrock if needed? Uh, well, I'd have to have that conversation with our construction team and subcontractor. Um, obviously, that answer is dependent on what essentially we find. Um, going down, I know there was concerns on the Yellen Lot project, um, and we essentially were told that there is a ledge there. Well, we dug multiple test pits, and in fact, it's just large boulders. Uh, the existing auto parking lot had the same concerns. We, we were able to excavate, excavate that area. Um, in the past so just based on the four foot cut here um, and based on some of the boring logs i don't foresee it being that large of an issue i've more seen boulders in the area um, and we steve and i that. can answer that question uh this is brian dotolo with haskell uh the question regarding the um if we do encounter ledge in the past we have done some some blasting before to go ahead and get that ledge removed or we can go ahead and uh chip and hammer uh, whatever ledge we do find and, and process, process that into gravel and use that as fill. Okay, yeah, so this is this is just something we'd want to make sure we got the proper information in front of us in accordance with the 560 regs. That goes back to the cut fill questions and, again, make sure everything's presented to us so we can evaluate it appropriately. So that would be one of them. If you are going to propose blasting, we understand what the blasting is, what the, the monitoring requirements are for that, et cetera understand and we will okay this is Sil Quang I'm the engineer at the Fruit Lake Killing Lee site the uh, plant engineer all right what we're looking at right now is the uh, reforestation plan hold on hold on a second I think the secretary was looking for who that was that was responding to Brian's comment um, I think he said it was Brian Dottolo but was he he's present in the audience right that is correct I'm with Haskell Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, again, this is Sil Quenga. I'm the uh, engineer for the Frito-Lay plant here in Killingly. All right, what we're looking at is the uh, forest uh, management plan. Um, I can't see underneath the uh, window, but it's the one from 2000 and... 21. Hold on, we're going to... Jonathan's going to yeah. move the... Oh, uh -huh. He's going to move the view. <laughs> There we go. All right, from uh, 2011. All right, and uh, what I did is the blue box basically indicate uh, the following slides, uh, A through E, of the different areas based upon the forest management plan from that time frame. Uh, the picture below is a shot from Google uh, showing the, uh, the bottom of the page is the uh, western portion along Maple Street. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is the uh, employee entrance that was put in back then, um, along with the uh, parking lot uh, down bottom. You can see a couple groves of trees that were installed per the plan on the uh, north and south side of the traffic entrance, and the bottom picture shows the uh, line of trees along um, uh, Tracy Road. Next slide, please. Uh, this here is um, the actual employee entrance uh, by the railroad crossing. Uh, looking uh, from uh, uh, picture one, that's basically from the railroad tracks looking in, and it matches the grove of uh, small grove of trees, and then that big long line area. You can see the front end of that uh, slide. Picture number two is uh, from uh, actually on the employee entrance looking in, where you can see uh, that line of trees um, as it extends towards the uh, east. And the bottom of the picture, that's just for a, a, a graphic or picture description of, that's the dirt road part uh, heading south. And you can see um, our rail spur there, and then there's some grove of trees, and then on the uh, right-hand side of the picture would be the actual main rail line as well. So again, a considerable, considerable distance from uh, Maple Street. And next slide, please. All right, this is the employee parking lot area. Um, 
So you can see where the groves of trees were planted. Um, you can see uh, picture one is right there inside the parking lot on the uh, looking towards the, the west. All right, you see the uh, landscaping fill on the embankment. Then there's a, a gr the grove of trees that were planted on the west side. Okay, and slide number two, uh, midway down, you can see uh, additional uh, trees that were planted along that side there. And then you see number three. So the difference between number two and number three is if you look at the top picture of number three, right above where that car is, you can see that rocky ledge and stuff up there. Yeah, right above that car there. Yep. So that's uh, you can't really plant a tree on a rock. So um, so the trees are planted on both sides of that rocky area. All right. In reference to the other green areas, um, those are the existing uh, forestry areas with a canopy of trees over. So really, nothing much grows underneath that canopy. And uh, and I've, I've walked that multiple times now, and also walked it with the uh, planning and zoning group here, and it's fairly clear underneath. And last slide. Okay, um, this right here is the area back by the railroad spur. If you look at the top um, drawing underneath where it shows uh, number two, that was where the uh, old propane tank used to be. Um, when we did the rail spur, I did not uh, did not have this plan at the time, um, but what uh, we're assuming is that uh, back when the TC scoops line was going to be installed, uh, there was a thought of putting a rail spur there in the first place in that grove of trees. So right now you can see down from the bottom of the picture from points one and point two um, where that, uh, that western boundary is there, right? And in the spring, uh, and, and with this plan here, that we did clear that area We'll fill that area in with the trees as shown in this plan. Oh, one more slide. So this is the um, down towards the um, the uh, nine. Uh, this is back back when the parking lot was expanded for the um, on the old Minogue property. It was probably the best way to describe it. Um, this was the the plan here, but we actually didn't. Uh, go that far with the parking lot. So if you look at the picture where it kind of shows the, the green L worth of plantings, all right, I, I put that over on the Google Maps picture. So it was decided to leave that area as undeveloped. And then the area just to the east of that, you can see the plantings from the Google picture, all right? And then off, which is number two, and you can also see the, uh, the picture down bottom, number two, of those plantings that were put in with those trees. In addition, up high on the uh, raised portion of what we call the eight and 900 lot at Frito-Lay, uh, picture one, those are the, that's the grove of trees that we planted along the top, which is at a higher elevation than two. In addition, this is also a great picture because it shows sort of where we would be putting the additional parking that was chevroned or diagonal uh, based upon your feedback. So orig the original plan was to take that eight and 900 lot and pull it all the way over towards the property line. Um, and of course, that would keep it at a high elevation. You'd see the, you'd, you'd probably see a lot more, and it'd be more difficult to try to add a berm in addition to, you know, filling that area in. Uh, so, the final plan we came up and what was presented today was to put that diagonal parking. So, when you look at the picture, where it shows the number two pointing down with that small grove of trees there, that would be where the parking is. That's a lower area, just to the left of that that other part of that grove of trees, that's actually part of a hill. So when you look down on the picture, on the bottom picture, you can kind of see the white where it's kind of flat and then it jumps up right there. That's actually the hill part. So that hill part would maintain and that lower part would be, be brought down to at grade with the existing south lot that uh, we just built. If that helps describe it on that section. All right, so um, what questions do you have about the reforestation plan and the review of that? It's hard to be a, a remote location and try and interpret back and forth. You're showing us a picture of a plan that's the 2011 layout. And I'm looking at, the only thing I can come up with is, I don't know if you can see this, but this is the plan that you gave us last month. And if you look, let me highlight it. Now, hopefully you can see it. If 
spot. There's two circles. Well, you can't see it, I guess. So this is kind of funny. Yeah. So right in this area or right in this area are the areas that are concerned for me. And my concern is basically, like I said, visual from the, the uh, Maple Street. Okay, if we bring my, my presentation back up, I can show you where I believe that's where your area of concern is. So please bring the presentation back up. Okay, and the previous slide to this one. Okay, I, th you know, I, I, I live right in the area as well. I'm a resident of Killingly, and so I, I drive by there. So what I'm thinking you see um, is this area right here. So what you're seeing is um, towards the uh, uh, potato receiving area. Um, that was part of the tree plan for the uh, 2010 that never that was never built because that rail spur was never put in and there were actually more trees there so the project was never completed in that area in 2010 it was decided not to install the scoops line in this area um, so our plan now is in the springtime we will install that grove of trees along that side over there to help buffet that uh, that view so what yeah when you so. say you're gonna plant trees what What's the expectations on growth and what, over what period of time before they're significant enough to block the visions of like the ASRS plant building and then the proposed new building? So the proposed new building is on the far side of the plant and what you're probably, what you see from that area is the existing, um, we call it the P&H Crane building uh, from the original 1980 build. Um, it's the most south high rise in the facility. The facility used to have a crane operation for its corn cook um, uh, in that well, area first, there. First off, let me, let me, you know, first off, what I'm looking at is the existing ASRS building. And unless I'm mistaken, it, to the west of that building is going to be the proposed new building. So am I correct in that or am I wrong? Um, I believe sort of what you're looking of at the existing and, ASRS building. Okay, so when I say existing ASRS building, so the site w in 1980 was built with a large ASRS, Automated Storage and Retrieval System, um, one of its first of its kind, great automation. This is the 70 foot building. That um, we this approved. is the, the old tan building that you can see from the back side of the plant there. So if um, try to go back to slide one, maybe I might be able to, might be on that picture there from the overhead pick. You can't see my plans, unfortunately. No. All right. So let's go all the way back to slide one. There we go. Yep. Oops. Now it's gone. There we go. Okay. So what I believe it's, you're seeing, I'm going to have to show the folks down here and then have the individual with a mouse follow what I'm looking at. So you're not, I'm not seeing that building on that plan. The, the new ASRS is going to the north off the picture that you see there. The new ASRS is uh, just uh, under where the uh, letter B is. Correct. That's what I understand. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's far, and that's on the far side of the plant from where the opening would be where the rail spur is. But that's my point. I can see the existing one, which is right behind, beside it. All right. What I'm saying is, you you see the 1980 ASRS, that one there. The tallest? No, no. I'm seeing the new ASRS building. The existing, the one that's already there, 70 foot tall. Would it help if I 
help if I show but all your pictures are, are from on site looking off site. Okay. So if you were had pictures from off site, maybe that's what I need should have done is take pictures off site myself and show them. Yeah, I know. Let me try to get the picture. Keith, picture. Jonathan's trying yeah. to get up a Google Google map right now so we can look at it from that point. I think the point would be a, a, a simple walk down Maple Street and look. The, 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 that whole area is exposed. It's exposed to everybody that drives by, everybody that lives over that way. Unfortunately, I can't say that it was right there across the street from the old restaurant or maybe a little further north. I was looking at Frito-Lay's facility and not so much as what was to my left but you're looking at such a strong angle to the north, northeast, that yeah, you're wide open to the to the ASRS building. When then and and also the building you were first referring to. I mean, it's all pretty visible. And and that's my concern. It's that you know you've gotten great extremes to try to provide buffers visual buffers at least and uh, obviously vegetation does provide uh sound buffers that it just needs to be a little more extensive down there and the question is if you plant trees does that mean it's only going to be really uh doing its job in 15 20 years or 30 years or is it going to be you know what's what can we expect now um but it's a wide open buffer. This is, and I, I just don't get why there hasn't been more means uh, taken to try and do something more permanent, and especially in that area. The rest of the area actually looks pretty well covered and protected. I, I'll agree with you. Can, but can there I... is a whole section down there where it isn't. Excuse me. And this is, uh, part of the special permit process is to protect the buffers and protect the residential neighborhoods which uh, adjoin, you know, an industrial area. And so that's where my concern is coming from. Excuse me, if I could. This is Dave Cody. Yes. Um, for the for the last couple of presentations that we had, there was the eleven five set and a twelve twenty set submitted to the board. Regarding the I need to speak up. I'm sorry, but I'm having difficulty hearing you. Documents previously submitted uh, to the board at the 11, uh, 5 or 10 hearing as well as the 1220 hearing with the views from Upper Maple Street. We've selected six views uh, that are on file that we reviewed at the last time during the summer conditions, which also represents the full trees and view lines uh, where the plant is not visible in those six sections could you please uh at least try to keep going back to that uh, as previously submitted and what you've we've just been talking through is the winter conditions to your point is the worst case scenario but these trees are the full growth as part of the previous submission as well as including the berms for the the four to six areas shown i think that's worth mentioning well, oh, I agree that that area is very well protected. There, there, it's sir, very well buffered. There's four views there. Uh, I'm looking at one, so okay. if you can. Mr. Chairman, there's one, there's one more. There's one more slide from the power present the prior presentation, which Jonathan is trying to put up, which I'm hoping will help.
Well, while they're doing that, Mr. Chairman, I guess I just wanted to note, um, you know, I, I guess number one, we're just trying to make sure we understand the area that you're pointing to. Um, but once we do, you know, I, I think Frito Lay, you know, would be willing um, as a condition of approval to work with staff or, you know, ho however you'd like to do it um, to add some trees. Obviously, we'd have to define what they are, you know, the scope and so forth. But, you know, we're certainly willing to try to work with the commission on that issue. I mean, that's basically all I'm looking for is something, some kind of effort made to do that. It doesn't address it and say it has to be uh, only not visible during summer months. It's got to be not visible or minimize any impacts year, year round, I would believe, that would be my interpretation. Right, and, and, and I guess I just I would just add, you know, while while I don't think it's, you know, I think there are issues of you know a certain size tree being you know something that's feasible. But I think what was was put in previously by Frito Lay, you know, grew quite quickly. You know, looking today at some of the stuff that went in in that in that area. Um, do you have it? Yeah. I guess what I'm. I keep referring to is if you go into the industrial part, there's a complete long berm all the way along the property to the lake behind uh, which, uh, the United Naturals building, the Walgreens building, the uh, used to be the simple mattress building down to uh, automatic rolls. There's a berm and they just actually rebuilt a whole section of it behind the automatic rolls building. Now, they've gone to great lengths, and there's actually a heavy tree buffer behind that. It just seems that Frito Lay could do something a little more in this short section to provide more buffering for the public, for the, for the residents of the neighborhood. Uh, it seems like it would benefit both Frito Lay as well as the neighborhood. Um, something a little more permanent. Okay, this is Sil Quenga uh, back again, engineer at the Frito-Lay plant. So on slide number 15, if you go to slide 15, all right, the, uh, the bottom arrow. So, sorry, sorry, slide 18. Oh, okay, the bottom arrow, um, that crosses through um, one of those open areas. So we'll look through these pictures as we go down towards slide 25 now. All right, so this is a summertime view um, as you go through. And uh, so that's that's the view from the summertime with all the uh, deciduous trees. Um, you know, when the, when the leaves fall off the trees, you are correct. We can see more of the site. Um, and that's you know, as we plant uh, more trees, right, and they grow, right. Eventually, they will grow taller. Um, that is one of the uh, one of the trade offs that we do. For example, you know, as we worked with the um, with the with the town here, we put in the south lot as we stitch the uh, trees in along the uh, south lot part. It's a balance of what we can do to, to keep a certain amount of the deciduous trees as we add the uh, pine trees which will grow in to fill you know fill those graphs, gaps and get taller over time uh, we do have a mixture of trees I'm not an arborist but I'm trying to think of the ones that we put in there are some that were that grow what three two three feet a year that we put in when we mix those with some pines um, you know per the arborist design to uh, to you know, to, to one, to grow fast, to cover some areas as quickly as possible, but two, to have, you know, my favorite, which is the spruces, uh, to last over a longer period of time. That yeah. particular area you're at, behind those trees is all parking, all the truck parking, your new parking lots, 
Yeah. Um, yes, it is. This is across from the restaurant. If you go further north than this, about okay. two or 300 feet, is the area that I'm talking about more. This actually, you know, you don't have residential housing on this side. You go up a little bit further and you, and you do, and you're going up it's and looking field. at where that spur goes in. Yeah. And it's a wide open view. Um, I, you know, it doesn't need to be defined here. It's very clear. They're going to ride up Maple Street and handle it. Quite, quite frankly, this is pointless. I mean, unless you just want to call me a liar and I don't see what I'm seeing. Um, it's, I see I see an issue. I think there's an issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Mr. It doesn't meet the regulations by not having a buffering a year round buffering, then that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I guess just two quick thoughts. One is at the, we want to work with the commission and, and, but number two is I think, you know, the, the, the buildings that you're referring to were all, you know, they, they were all put up there as, as part of prior approvals. But I think at this point, if we can simply make sure we're all on the same page in terms of where this area is, as I said earlier, you know, our rather than trying to draft something, you know, with non-tree people here tonight, our suggestion would be condition of approval in X area, you know, to perhaps to be worked out, you know, with staff and subject to uh, staff approval, something like that. But conceptually, we are certainly willing to try to be responsive to that concern if we can just get a handle on you know where it is and then try to come up with something i agreed i agreed but and also keep in mind that this is an earlier issue as well that's why the tree management plan was supposed to be implemented at the 2010 phase yeah this, so, this was the same part of that that project as well okay um uh, so it's an ongoing thing that should be addressed in a more permanent fashion um, anything else or any other commissioners? None. Anybody from the public want to speak to this application? Um, there is someone in the office. Um, excuse me, not the office, but the audience. Um, Karen, do you want to take up to the microphone, please? Good evening, my name is Karen Johnson, 1819 Upper Maple Street. Um, I commented in November and I did observe, although I didn't attend um, in person at the November, excuse me, the de December hearing. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a whole lot to talk about this evening. So I'm gonna try to make my comments very, very discreet. Um, you have a letter that I submitted which call out what I think are significant zoning deficiencies, which I raised um, most of them in November. Um, some of them have been addressed, but the majority have not. Um, I think, first of all, my comments related to this whole process. <sighs> I, I, I think um, it's almost embarrassing that a company the size of Frito-Lay is putting the commission through this. And I'm, I'm sorry, I know you're looking right at me. I apologize. Could you speak up, please, Karen? I find it professional, but what you're putting the commission members through is reprehensible. So first off, I would like to thank um, specifically Chairman Thur Thurlow and Commission Member Card, as well as um, all of the three other commission members who have asked such good probing questions on an application that represents the most significant expansion of Frito-Lay in 10 years and cumulatively um, probably the largest expansion since they were originally approved. So all of the points that have been brought up in terms of impacts, concerns, visibility, noise, odor, uh, you know, overall scope of environmental impacts and impacts on our neighborhood have been raised over the years. Um, we have called, <laughs> we, have, we have tried to deal, I know um, specifically with regard to the, to the noise issue, um, one of our residents around the lake spent hours, hours 
with Roger trying to isolate and address these concerns. It was mentioned briefly, however, uh, once Keith, Such, and Roger got to a point of almost a resolution, all communications were cut off. Um, and then the formal application was submitted. This was submitted in August, it's now January. There is absolutely no reason that a company the size of Frito-Lay that is being supported by a national company like Haskell should submit a com an incomplete application and then drag this process out. The last thing I want to do is ask that this be continued to another night of torture <laughs> because that's exactly <laughs> what it is. Um, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for uh, attorney Joe Hammer, um, but it's, he's, a, he's a very thoughtful and thorough attorney, but it's evident that his client is not listening to him. And it really feels like Haskell is driving this process and trying to do it in the least expensive manner with the least thoughtful approach to this application. Um, all of this new information that's been presented is extremely relevant, it's very important. This hearing should not be closed tonight um, so that the commission members and the staff can process all of this information and try to figure out what's reasonable as a condition of approval. The reason we're in this situation is because <laughs> we don't have a really good set of, of baseline information about what's happening out there today. And, and I'm just going to bring up the noise again. We hired our own consultant at our own cost. He's on the line. I would very much like to have Doug Bell have an opportunity to ask questions of Mr. Brooks through the chair or through staff, however is most appropriate. It's an unusual format that we're all dealing with with hybrid. I appreciate that that's complicated. Um, but this is a brand new report just submitted this evening. Uh, we acknowledge we just submitted our report this afternoon. This is a tremendous amount of information. We need more time. And we need time to review what's been submitted. A couple of days prior to each of the last hearings, new plans have been submitted. And I appreciate, you know, the questions that have been raised about volume of film material. If I take 19,000 cubic yards, that's a thousand trucks. Is all of that going off site? Obviously we don't know the answers to that, but then what are the impacts on traffic? Probably nothing, considering the level of service, but we don't know that. And we also don't have a reasonable construction phasing plan. Um, I requested in my letter that uh, a construction management plan, a construction phasing plan be prepared and submitted. They have enough information now. My, my assessment, my understanding, Haskell can please tell me if I'm wrong, this is a design build contract. You're out here, um, you, to the extent that you think that you're already going forward, you've advanced your plans so they're almost construction level, but yet when commission members ask questions, you don't have the answers for them, you have the answers. You know what the situation is. You probably have all your subcontractors lined up. You know where your employees are coming from. You know that a lot of them are probably staying at the hotel. Um, this whole notion of contractors carpooling is just never going to happen. So just admit <laughs> that um, there are certain provisions that will take place and, and, a, and provide some mitigation for them. I, be adults about this. I mean, we know you're going to get approved, and, and that's, that's correct. You, sh you should get approved. But you should get approved with appropriate conditions that take into consideration all of the impacts of this project. And historically, uh, at some of these meetings, we've heard from staff, we've heard from uh, our attorney representing the commission, representing the town. Well, you know, there's certain things that you can't ask for uh, because of such and such a case, in this case, in that case. You know what? Ask for it. Because the likelihood is they're going to give it to you because they want an approval. And if these are reasonable things, there are a number of issues that they've already acknowledged. Yeah, you know, sure, we'll do it. Ask us, we'll do it. Put it in as a condition of approval so that in two years when they do a minor parking lot expansion like they did in the spring, 
on the Yellen law or the South law or whatever it's called, the point that Chairman Thurlow is trying to make to all of you is an area where I walk several times a week. I come around the corner after walking around the lake. The Lake Tavern is on my left. I look over, and now all I see are 700 or how many of our, our tractor trailers are out there. When I drive by in the evening, all I see are the 45-foot light poles. So I, I, I guess just be a responsible citizen, whether it's Frito-Lay or Haskell. I, I don't care who you are. Be a responsible citizen of this community. Present a, a comprehensive set of information that staff can review, that uh, reviewing engineers can review, that the town attorney can review, that the commission members can review, and understand exactly what it is that you're proposing. You're going to get your approval. Just do it right so that the members of the commission who are volunteers and spend their hours, hours, it looks almost like, like Commissioner Card is traveling for business and sitting in a hotel, so that these people that spend their time have an opportunity to do a thoughtful review and give you an approval that makes sense. Because guess what? What happened last time? I think you know. If it's not right, I will take an appeal. It's not a threat. It's a simple fact. Um, we all want the same thing. I don't want to go through that process again to have to hire an attorney. It's a nightmare. I don't want to be here tonight. I don't want to spend hours, probably at this point, 50 hours of my personal time reviewing these plans to come up with what? The fact that you didn't comply with your 2010 special permit? And then, gee, you're making an enormous accommodation to, to move the lot? I, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I have mentioned before, I do this for a living. When I go into a community and they ask me to do something, if that something is reasonable and it's going to get me my approval, I do it. Because it's not that complicated. So I really don't understand why it is that you're fighting probably the very good advice of your own attorney, the reviewing engineer's questions, and the questions of the commission members. So at this point, I'm not going to talk about all of the things I think are wrong about this application. For me, it's more about the process and that this is an opportunity to put into place reasonable conditions and reasonable ongoing monitoring that Frito-Lay should have to bond for all the things that they say, oh, don't worry, we're going to comply with your sound, we're going to comply with this, we're not going to have an impact here, bond for it. Do your homework, submit a complete application, give the commission the information that they need to make a decision, and then put your money where your mouth is and bond for it. And then you can go ahead and build it. But not until then. This is an opportunity to correct what was wrong 40 years ago, which is uh, a set of plans that don't have enough detail and don't have reasonable considerations for offsite impacts for the neighborhood. It's not, it's not hard. It, you, you can do all of these things. Yes, they cost money. This reported project at $230 million can afford it. So I would like to find out if there's a way to add in um, attorney Mary Miller and Doug Bell from Kavanaugh Tochi. I believe they're already on sign, signed on to WebEx. They are. Can we they, should yeah. be able can to they, speak, Karen. They are can everyone on. hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce, um, as Karen already noted, noted the you met Mary, you're Mary Miller? So, yeah, so this is attorney Mary Miller. I've spoken with the commission before um, on behalf of Alexander's Lake Homeowners Association. Um, and the last time I spoke with you all, um, one of the topics I had spoken about was my concern regarding the acoustic studies that had been done and what we felt still needed to be done. Um, and at the time I had said that we that we were planning to hire um, our own uh, our own expert to do that kind of analysis, at least to tell the commission what we feel needs to be done and parameters that should be in place 
Um, just like Karen was saying, I feel the commission has been asking all the right questions. I wish you were getting more answers to your questions, but your questions are fantastic. Um, and I also sympathize with attorney Hammer. I know we all would like to wrap this hearing up, but there are still things that need to be done. And one of my biggest concerns and one of my clients biggest concerns are with what has been done to date regarding noise mitigation the way the study has been put together, the fact that it's not complete, and what should be done moving forward to confirm that you know mitigation has actually been taken care of. And that's what I would like Mr. Bell to speak briefly on and to give you all the opportunity to ask him questions. He did, um, through me, submit a three-page letter. It has a lot of this in detail, but he also has been on the line um, to hear what uh, what was said earlier this evening by Mr. Brooks, and I believe he might have a few additional comments on that. Um, in addition, I would like to reiterate that the major reason that I was hired was because if the noise issue isn't actually properly taken into account, um, I have every right to appeal as well. I don't want to do that, but I really will if we don't end up with some sort of parameters that show, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be some sort of proof that Frito-Lay is actually taking the commission's recommendations. Um, and I do believe we're all expecting there will be some recommendations with a post-construction noise study um, that they're actually doing it, you know? And so that's something too, to keep in mind when you're deciding what kind of restrictions we'll put in place is how will you know it gets done later? How will I know it gets done later? Um, and so something to keep in mind while, um, while Mr. Bell is giving a statement. But I believe you can also just start speaking, um, Doug, because I think that's just the way WebEx works. So I'm gonna mute myself and allow you to make the points that you want to make. Thank you. No sound. Nobody's talking, Keith, that's why. No, he was trying to talk. Nope. You may need to get closer to your microphone. There's no noise at all. Can you unmute? Can you hear me? Just shake your head yes down. Testing, is this better now? There Much better. Okay. Uh, microphone switched off in the process. All right. Um, my name is Douglas Bell. I've been, I, I'm with Kavanaugh Tachi Associates. We're an acoustical consulting firm from Sudbury, Massachusetts. We've been in business since 1975. I've been with Kavanaugh Tachi uh, since 1989. I'm currently a senior principal consultant and also the president of the firm. Uh, first off, I want to say that uh, Bennett Brooks and I have a long, long history of working together and have deep respect for our, each other and for their, for their work. I think Bennett would shake his head and agree. Uh, having said that, I, I have only fairly new to this, this party here. I just um, I have briefly had a chance to see some documents that have been prepared. I looked at some uh, video from a previous uh, town meeting, but um, I have some comments more just to to the board in, in terms of how they would look at, you know, a proposal like this from the acoustic standpoint, what's normally done? What are the kind of things that are generally part of orders of conditions in a process like this? And I, I my letter outlines those comments fairly clearly, I think, but um, uh, just a very brief review of that. The, the first thing is, is that comes to my mind is, is I don't believe that there has ever been a definitive statement from Frito that they comply with the local or with the state noise regulation. They said they've done engineering reviews. Uh, they've got data that might support that, but um, they, there really is not a rigorous study that, that has taken measurements at property lines, um, has asserted um, that the sound levels meet both the A-weighted sound level limits, and more importantly, also the fact that there are there are other criteria as part of the regulation that require that there be a study for tonal analysis, uh, which uh, may or may not have been done, but certainly has not been uh, provided. Um, if, if there are tones or sounds that meet that criteria, the limits are not 51 decibels as, as stated, but would be reduced to 46 decibels. So that makes a big difference. Uh, the second thing is, is that when you review a project like this, it's, the, it's not the noise source of the various components, but it's still the aggregate of the facility and the new additional sources that need to be reviewed. So um, uh, when, when, when a pro program, uh, when you have a facility that was stated at the earlier presentation, it's only 40 decibels, 
uh, that that suggests that it, it's going to have very likely have very little additive component to what's already out there but that that's not to say that it's going to have no additive component so um typically in a process like this the next step along with asserting and knowing what your existing impacts are with your facility then you have to do acoustic modeling and goal setting such that when you add new components to the facility of the, to the facility that the, the again the accumulated noise sources first meet the no, local noise criteria or the, the regulations that are required and also uh, don't create a noise nuisance and so uh, to that end um the, the there really needs to be some comprehensive facility noise evaluation that looks at the various phases of this project as in the ASR, ASRS, the production facility, and any other new noise sources, and, and combines them with what's already out there to, to again, to be able to assert uh, that, that, that um, these uh, limits and goals are, are not exceeded. Um, the, typically, uh, that, that report would include a, a, an acoustic model, as was indicated by Mr. Brooks, regarding uh, utilizing ISO 9613 standards. Uh, the report needs to be comprehensive, though, so that it can be peer reviewed and, and evaluated in such a way that it lists, um, it shows a site plan showing all the noise sources that are modeled. It shows a table of all the sound power levels of all the sources so that they can be, you know, uh, reviewed to make sure that they, again, fall within what would be expected. If there's noise mitigation in the design, it needs to be included in there so that later it can be determined whether that in, was implemented by the, the construction team and the contractor. So there needs to be a, a fairly comprehensive report that defines acoustic goals at appropriate receptor locations, mostly the sensitive uh, noise receptors along the um, east side of uh, Maple Upper Maple Street, um, and, and then finally, um, uh, you know, following post construction, and that can be on a phase basis or at the, you know, is that there needs to be acoustic testing at the receptor properties. Uh, to again determine and show and then demonstrate that one the project is still in compliance and has met its acoustic goals. Uh, typically the um, compliance testing portions requires it typically requires the submission of a protocol of how you would plan to do this demonstration so that can be reviewed and accepted by the town prior to implementing it so that you, know, you don't go down the wrong street and everybody Everybody's in agreement that this is a fair way to test the facility and, and meet these goals. So uh, these are all things that are, are regularly implemented. This, that's the process of most of this, uh, you know, large expansions of projects like that that I'm familiar with, uh, particularly when, when noise is a, a hot topic on the project. And they're, uh, you know, based on the data that I certainly reviewed, it, it's pretty clear that there are acoustic impacts from the Frida facility already in the neighborhood key here is, is try to minimize them, keep them in context with the existing acoustic environment and, and, um, and, and demonstrate that all in advance uh, so that, that, that you're not trying to control something that might be very difficult to do at the end. There, I think I've said what I wanted to say. Do any of the members of the commission have any questions for Mr. Bell at this point? Um, in addition, we can make him available. Um, we would also request that the hearing be continued um, because I do think there's a lot of information that just came in um, and he could certainly be available at one of your next meetings. Um, but if you have questions for him right now, that's why we wanted to make sure he was here this evening in case you do intend to make this the last hearing. Um, Commissioners, any questions? Well. Would it be okay if we came up with a question that we give it to Anne Marie and Anne Marie would convey it to that gentleman? I would not have a problem with that, Berga. Okay, and that would not create any legal issues. That's correct. You, right. If you have any questions after this, you should forward them to staff. Staff can forward them out. Okay. Right, and, and it can slater for the record. That assumes that the hearing is staying open, of course. Uh, but if the hearing closed, you wouldn't be able to submit the question yeah. through and get that. Uh, I have a question. Any other questions? Yes, I do. I have a question ahead, John. concerning what you just said. When was this project first brought before the town of Killingly? And was it, when was it made public? I mean, how long has, has uh, this attorney and this attorney, uh, uh, engineer been on board? Why, don't, why isn't their report done at this point? I mean, why is uh, 
Has it has it has this just been uh, made public within the last month, where they didn't have an opportunity to uh, to be a little further along than than what they are right now? Saying, you know, that uh, uh, a comprehensive study has to be done. I mean, we requested a comprehensive study, I believe, of of uh, of the people sitting here this evening, and we had a meeting. I, when was the last one? It was two months ago, not one month. Uh, wasn't that the first meeting that we had? The first meeting we had uh, where they came and attended was in November. With November. But if when you do remember, if you do remember the actual file date, hold yeah. on, I can get it right now. May, may I just respond to some of the timing? No, it, the, seems, it seems to me that that should be known. Right now, I mean, what what are we doing? The uh, all the information should be here now. It would seem to me, so that uh, this process can move one way or the other. Yeah, I guess I would just like to add the application was submitted. I think on August sixth, it was received by the commission. On August sixteenth, I was here in September, requesting a continuance so that we could continue negotiations with the Lake Association. We then had hearings on November 15th and December 20th. During the discussions with the Lake Association, we provided with them, and I think this was... When did you have that discussion with the Lake Association? We started discussions with the Lake Association in late August and continued right up till the November 15th meeting. Prior to the November 15th meeting, we gave them a complete copy of the March 21 report by Mr. Brooks, which summarized his October 2020 um, field sound test. So they've had that report in their possession, um, I believe, at the latest. It was either late October or maybe the first week in November. Um, so that, that's you know, been out there for a while. So I'll go, I'm not quite sure where you're coming from, but my sense is that this is a big, th a big project, uh, one in a series of complicated issues, and if we take the time to get it done better than has been done in the past, that's all to the good. Providing there's some sort of sanity to it. I'm going to agree with what Ms. Johnson said. You know, a lot of time has been spent already. And I, I mean, if we're in a situation where this thing is just being drawn out, I mean, uh, shame on us. It seems to me that both sides have to be responsible and expedite this thing. That's, that's the, the, my focus, okay. Any other commission members? Any other com public comment? Anybody from the audience that wants to speak? I'm not there, so I can't see you. Nobody? Nope, there's no one. There's no one from the audience, sorry. Okay. Um, staff, questions? Uh, not at this time, but I have been discussing with our attorney, so I'll let our attorney speak. Please. Ken, Ken Slater, for the record. Um, it, I think it speaks to a couple of comments that you just heard. What you need to evaluate is whether you have enough information uh, to be able to fashion, if you were, if you were considering approval, do you have the, all the information you need to be able to fashion good conditions to, to do uh, what uh, Christian Lorenz was, was mentioning to make sure it's done right. If you have the information and it's just a matter of, of uh, you know, working it through with the assistance of staff, with the assistance of me, coming and having a good uh, set of conditions of approval, then you go ahead and, and close the public hearing. If you think that there's loose ends that really need to be closed in order for you to be comfortable to approve the application, you know, for example, the applicant has, you know, has proposed, by the way, a, a series, uh, you know, some conditions. Attorney Hammer had mentioned it, uh, but, you know, that several, you know, items 2, 8, 11, 12, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 22 of the 
uh, peer review, they said that they'll comply with that. As a condition of approval, they'll comply with that. If having them being assured that that is going to be complied with and staff will review and confirm compliance, then closing the public is, is closing the hearing makes sense. As was mentioned earlier uh, by uh, Commissioner Card, if some of this information is the kind of stuff that the commission should see before it's comfortable deciding it, then keeping the public hearing open. But I think it, it behooves the commission to, and, and the applicant and everyone else, if there is a need to keep it open, to try to define what new information needs to come in. Because if there isn't anything new, then we should just be able to you know, roll up our sleeves and, and, and come up with a decision and, and conditions of approval, or I'm not gonna presume for approval, it could be denial. Okay, so I think a lot of new ground was turned over tonight. And I would hope, I don't know whether it's partly your job or Anne Marie's job to put it on paper. I have a hard time remembering stuff that goes in through my ears. I need to see it through, you know, I, I'll remember it if I read it. I don't remember it if I hear it. So <laughs> that's just my handicap and I'm sure I'm not alone. So that if we could get a compilation of today's uh, agreements, disagreements, um, new issues and all of that then we can get a, to the next step but at this point I think it's premature to say okay we're going to vote on it tonight oh and I wasn't suggesting voting on it tonight I think no, that I, would be a mistake okay because I would say that's a mistake there's work to be done yeah. to come up with a good condition but if there's information you don't have yet that that someone has requested time uh, for and you think that there's a need for that, then keep it open for that purpose. And I, I don't know, I, I don't want to speak for the applicant either. Based on everything the applicants heard from members of the commission, maybe the applicant would prefer to present additional information, or maybe the applicant is still of the mind as it was when it started that we're ready to close the hearing. So I, I, I would ask Attorney Hammer if, having heard what he's heard tonight, is there additional information that you'd, uh, that you'd like to uh, provide so that you'd prefer the hearing be kept open for at least a, a limited purpose. Thank you, Attorney Slater. We're, we are comfortable closing the hearing tonight, although I do have some additional remarks and proposed conditions and, and other items that I would like to review with the commission, you know, before you conclude. Um, so, you know, we, we hope that you would conclude tonight and I and I guess just a couple of concerns if the Commission were to decide not to conclude tonight I, I think it, it would define be fine conclude do you mean close the public hearing or do you mean vote on it? close the public hearing because as, as attorney Slater explained once you close the public hearing you can't get any more information right. from anybody as you know right. and and I get so I'm really referring to well we, we would encourage you to you know close and vote but uh, we I think we're that ready to close happen. we're ready to close and and I guess um, if the Commission decides not to close you know I, I would hope we can avoid you know a ping-pong match that you know goes on forever and and I think we're sitting as attorney Slater suggested if you are going to continue it I think it should be very very narrowly defined and frankly I, I think if the intervener is allowed to submit any additional, you know, expert testimony, uh, evidence, you know, at the next hearing, that would be extremely prejudicial to the applicant because there are time limits, as you know, on these proceedings. And if they're allowed to come back at your next meeting and present, we basically are deprived of a meaningful opportunity to digest it, understand it, question question it and possibly respond to it on our own so I, I think that needs to be taken into account those time periods which are running and which we're very very close to at this point but however you'd like to do it I can perhaps if I speak to some of our proposals and suggestions on how you could close it and how you could handle these things on conditions of approval would that be helpful Ken Slater, for the record, I, I think it would, but before we do that, if I could ask for counsel for the intervener uh, who requested that it, the hearing be kept open, is there is there particular information that you believe that you need that came in tonight that you need time for? There, the, uh, the Mr. Brooks had testified 
uh, had presented his uh, information. You've had a consultant who has prepared a report and prepared presentation tonight. Is, is there anything new? What, what, if you could identify to the commission, is been new that you need an opportunity to respond to so that they could decide whether or not it really is required, uh, a request you know, that you, you need to be entitled to a fair hearing and have an opportunity to present information. I think you've had that opportunity. But if there's something in particular that maybe I'm not thinking or members of the commission are not thinking of that came out tonight that you haven't had an opportunity to present on, could you identify that so that the commission can carry, you know, consider that so that something could be narrowly defined if the commission decided to keep it open? So could you guide us on that or your perspective on that? Sure, no, absolutely, Attorney Slater. Um, I'd be happy to to say because I there is one thing I think would be potentially helpful to everyone and would be something we would like to speak to. And I was hoping we might be able to get to it tonight, but it, it looks like that might not be possible. And that is the conditions we've been speaking about. Um, I would have thought that by this round in the proceedings, we would have been a little more specific and we would know what the conditions might be. And it sounds like um, Attorney Hammer might be about to suggest um, conditions, which is great and helpful. And I do think we're going to need to have a series of conditions associated with this should it be approved. Um, we will not be prepared to hear them. We're gonna hear them for the first time from him. We won't be prepared to respond to them with suggestions of our own conditions. And so I would ask that the hearing be left open even for that limited purpose that, um, that he suggests his own uh, conditions. Maybe I'm guessing all of the commissioners have thoughts on them as well. And we'd be permitted to submit our suggestions in response. What we think the condition should be, we might agree with everything he's saying. Um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what they're going to be, but uh, I think we are willing to be limited to just that, if that is helpful. Um, we are not interested in dragging this on and on. I would have liked to have been able to do this before tonight. Um, and I, I do think we should be able to wrap that up and that it could be helpful to the commission as well to hear, especially with regard to things like noise, what we think the specific conditions are that should be put into the report. I say something. I think I heard both attorneys just say the same thing. You know, right. not being able to respond. If this thing goes on, you know, what do we do then? Do we do we uh, have each attorney's uh, respond and then uh, it goes on for for another meeting? I mean, uh, has there been enough time? That's that's what I would like to know right now in the process since it was first brought to the town for the expansion, for all sides to have played, you know, and participated uh, fully. I mean, if it has, I don't see why this thing should, uh, uh, why the public hearing should go on. Uh, and and I, I would add Ken Slater again for the record. I mean, ordinarily fashioning conditions, working on conditions. I mean, people could, during a public hearing could make suggestions all they want but that ordinarily is something that the commission bangs out after all of the evidence is submitted so on an application that's complex like this staff can to, to your point earlier uh, Commissioner Lawrence is, is to outline all the information that came in comments that have been made by uh, the third party reviewers what the responses were and outline all those things to be able to help you decide whether it's compliant and to fashion reasonable conditions. So if, if you have that information, that's what staff should be able to be doing, working you know, with me and then working together with the commission after the hearing closes. Um, and people would have had an opportunity by now to say these are the conditions I think you should, uh, you should propose. So you know, wanting to comment on conditions is, is really not an entitlement to keep the hearing open. I mean, alternatively, if you wanted to narrow it just to that, give you know the intervener an opportunity to propose their conditions and see the conditions and you hear from both sides only on the conditions you know they're not entitled to that in my opinion you could give them that if you think that would be helpful but if who, you think who, you can who's them in your the, the, the inter, the, what the intervener just said when i asked um uh, is you know what were the reasons to keep it open the intervener's counsel said because we would like to review and comment or propose conditions now those could have been proposed 
tonight. I mean, the things that the intervener believed should be attached to an approval, there was no reason they couldn't be presented tonight. So in my view, there's no entitlement to keep it open for that purpose. If you think it's helpful and you'd like to hear what their conditions are, and that's all they're really asking you here to do, I mean, it's conceivable that we agree that that is the only thing that's going to happen with a continuance is that they've submitted their proposed conditions and an opportunity to be heard uh, about other conditions. But you'd absolutely be within your rights if you think all the information has come in that's necessary for you to fashion reasonable conditions. Subject to Attorney Hammer is gonna, is gonna close and he's gonna propose some conditions. Um, and and, and the, the intervener could tonight as well. Subject to that, there's no reason to keep the public hearing open. But the public hearing should be kept open if there's some new information you think you need. Otherwise, it's just doing the hard work of coming up with good conditions yeah. if you're going to approve. Now, I think that there's a lot of information, um, but I just want to make sure that we have the, the time to think about them and figure out our response. But that can happen after the public hearing is closed. That's right. You have 65, if the public hearing did close tonight, you have 65 days to render, render your decision on the application. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, we close excuse me, John. Well, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion I, 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 we close is, the public hearing. Just listen to what is this appropriate first off, Attorney Slater? Well, uh, the, it, it's At a public only, hearing only oh, to close the public hearing. It, it's it's appropriate. Sometimes the chairman will just close. If that's, when oh, it's if that's what he's it. doing. He, no, I know he is. And, and why I would I would I would recommend to, to 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 ask him to take it off the table only because the applicant hasn't had an opportunity to close. And ordinarily, the applicant has the last word. There's new information that came in, and they wanted they wanted to present some proposed conditions. So I think they should be given that opportunity. But if everybody's spoken it after that, then I think the commissioner's motion to close the public hearing would be perfectly appropriate at that time, and that would be my recommendation. I was under the impression that everybody had finished, but if that's not the case, then I'll withdraw my my motion. I think he's close. <laughs> okay. First, first off, before we continue, I I do. I feel what we're getting, we need more. I would like to see more information on the you know, cup fills and where the materials go and, and the accounting of the traffic, truck traffic. Then I would like to see a more comprehensive plan for the buffering. I mean, if you want excuses why it should be stuffed open, those, those would be my two. Um, commissioners. Anybody else have any comments on that or not? Well, it sounds to me that the attorney just said that that uh, if we wanted X amount of some condition, let's say we want X amount more trees than they're proposing, then that can happen during the uh, making of the motion rather than the hearing part, right? But they want more information. Yeah, that's correct. But. Um, it's hard to deal with truck traffic and where the material is going if you don't know how much material and and where they intend to get rid of it. So you don't know the direction of the trucks are going to be traveling, uh, the amount of trucks that are going to be adding to the daily traffic volumes, and in which direction. Okay, so that's um, a legitimate issue, and so th that we could ask them right now that they have to provide that to us. Well, the point was we we have asked before, and and. We did get a number of 19,000 yards, and I believe, if I understood it correctly, that was for the parking area, not necessarily the the, the rest of the buildings. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. We, I think that was for the parking area. My understanding, and somebody can jump up from Haskell, um, is that the vast majority of the cut and fill is associated with the parking lot. Is that correct? Yeah. This is Stephen Cole. That's correct. Uh, part of the CLA common response has said that we will provide a full cut fill analysis in that all off volume. And this is Brian Dottolo once again uh, with Haskell. In terms of the location of the fill, uh, that is yet to, to be determined. Uh, no subcontracts have been awarded and no one's been engaged yet. But uh, the fill will either go to an existing borrow pit that can be transferred to another project in town at a later date or if there's an immediate need for fill on another project with a site contractor that we're working with, they may take that fill directly to that other job site 
So at this point, we do not know where that fill is going to be. It's going to either going to be on a borrow pit or another job site. So, so the fill is limited to the 19,000 yards. Is that correct? Stephen, would you like to answer that? In response to uh, Dave Capaccione's comments, we were specifically uh, requested to provide a cubic yardage of cut material from specifically the auto parking lot. Um, as part of the CLA comments, comments which we received last week, uh, we responded that a full site cut fill analysis will be performed. Those totals uh, will be provided. Um, I guess as a, as a condition. So currently what we have the 19,000 cubic yards is only for the auto parking lot. Okay. Other commissioners, do you have any specific issues that would uh, cause us to be remain open? Or you might think would have to be remain open. Brian? Um, like I said, I'm with you, Keith. I don't think 560 was adequately addressed, but I think um, we might be able to address that or control that in conditions that may be, you know, fashioned a certain way that the applicant may or may not be, you know, uh, agreeable with. But uh, if that information is not presented to us, you know, in accordance with 560, we have to address it one way or another. So I think I think the rest of the items we've we've got adequate information to address. Uh, formally and in, in conditions. Uh, Matthew? Uh, I'm in agreement that uh, I think that we have enough information, to be honest, um, less the information regarding the same issues that you guys brought up. So. Okay. Verga? Ditto. John? I'm good. Could I ask a question of the okay. applicant, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, do you expect that you'd be able to have the analysis that is was requested regarding all of the <coughs> cut and fill material uh, in time for the next meeting? Yes or no? Yes. yes. I, I think we could. Whoops. I think we could. One thing I certainly I think you can close the public hearing tonight. I think that's possible. One thing you could also do, because I think between now and next month, staff is going to be working hard, compiling all the information to try to assist you in starting your deliberations. That's not going to happen until next month anyway. It seems it's pretty clear. If you wanted to, instead of having you know a two-hour public hearing at this point, if it's narrowed down simply to presenting that information, so you get that information, you can work it into your conditions. And if the intervener wanted to propose a set of conditions that to those two things and those two things only is all that's going to happen in the hearing and that an, uh, an opportunity to, to and attorney hammer is going to lay out lay out his his conditions either now or if this very narrow way we approach it makes sense to uh, to uh, the applicant then the applicant and the intervener can exchange conditions between now and the next meeting and that the only thing that will happen and as the public hearing portion of the next meeting would be to present that additional information and people can comment on that additional information and that information only. Is that an appropriate way to, to approach it in your views? Obviously the commission's judgment ultimately, but that would that be an appropriate well, way to proceed attorney hammer? I, I guess, you know, again, I hope through my concluding remarks to hopefully be of assistance just in terms of the commission evaluating its comfort level. And it is the commission's judgment whether to continue or not. But if you do, then I, I think what attorney, I think what attorney Slater suggested, as I understood it, was it would be continued for the sole purpose of determining conditions as to number one, the cut and fill and understanding the amount of truck traffic associated with it, and number two, the noise conditions. But there would be no further testimony, expert testimony submissions at all. It would be limited to those two issues. That's correct. And, and, and I would ask the uh, intervener's counsel uh, that 
uh, that she would agree that that would be an appropriate way to proceed to address her concerns to be able to present conditions. I, I think that's an appropriate way to proceed. I will mention just, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, if I am crafting noise conditions, I would obviously be doing that with the assistance of Mr. Bell, um, it not being my own area of expertise, but I'm guessing the commission may have guessed that. Of, of course, but it would just be presenting, you, you could present commit conditions and comment on conditions proposed, but the only new substantive information that's going to come in is going to be to respond uh, to the uh, the questions regarding the cut and fill in traffic. So that that yep. would be a way to, we could proceed. Yep. No, that sounds great. And um, throughout, I, I feel that I've had a pretty good relationship with um, Attorney Hammer, who I do greatly respect, and hopefully we'd be able to connect on the conditions in advance. Um, and that would probably save some time, too, so we're not belaboring this beyond what we have to. Yeah. And just so the public can understand that simply because it's a public hearing, it doesn't mean that you can come and say, I want to hear, be heard on something else. This is it. Everybody's had an opportunity. We've narrowed down the focus. And um, again, I'm assuming it sounds like the applicant, if he's given a chance to say a few more words, and the intervener, right. in a, now it sounds like they are in agreement that this would work, that, the, that Mr. Chair, that you, you would have every right to call anybody out of order to try to speak at the next hearing on anything other than that new information. And that should keep the public hearing at more like a 15 minute hearing than, than and what we're looking at tonight. Sorry, if I could just add, you know, again, we hope the commission would be comfortable closing the hearing tonight. I would like to do my remaining, um, the remainder of the presentation, I'll be as quick as I can, but I, I also would note, you know, in, in many respects, I think the, the letter that was submitted by Mr. Bell in tandem with the letter from Mrs. Johnson, you know, really did lay out to you the conditions that they're looking for on sound. It's, I think it's already there, basically, in, in many respects. So, with that said, could I continue and, and, and try to finish up uh, as best I can? Uh, I don't know if anybody else got any other commissions, any comments at this point? Well, okay, I have one. go ahead, Mr. Bell. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I'd like to add mm -hmm. one thing to it. Do a water okay, sample. Okay, John. Do a water sample and bring that to us. Excuse me? I'm looking for a water sample. Um, Can you right. be more specific? They claim that, uh, you know, that's one of, one of the accusations, that there's a film on that yeah. lake. I, Let's find out whether or not it's true or not. That's all. I, We're coming back for two th issues. That, yeah. That's a minor one. I, I, I guess with all due respect, Commissioner, I... Again, I'm hopeful that we'll wrap it up tonight, but if it's not wrapped up tonight, I would hope it would be solely limited to those conditions and, and not reopening or revisiting, you know, these other issues. There, there was no specific evidence of that. Frankly, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know that that's even within your purview of the commission and the type of review that you have before you tonight. Um, and, and I guess one other thing I would just mention is, I think there's also a question as to whether, I think you've been very accommodating to the intervener, but they did intervene under the Environmental Protection Act. And frankly, sitting here right now, I think there's a real question as to whether the further contributions they might like to make on noise and sound conditions is, you know, is even under the Environmental Protection Act. So again, those are all the reasons I, I hope we can wrap it up, but let me, let me, let me I, just I would actually object to that. Um, I'm, I, I apologize, but I have raised noise issues under this act a lot in all the way to the Supreme Court. You can definitely bring that up to a planning and zoning commission under the Environmental Protection Act. I have no doubt of that. Right, so let me, to, if there's any concern by the commissioners, I'm happy to further explain that. Let, let me, I'm perfectly comfortable with our own power to deal with noise. Can, may I, may, why don't I just continue? So just briefly, to try to, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to try to handle what we would suggest as conditions. I would just want to respond to quickly to a couple of items. And why don't I just take the special permit first? That was for height to go from 50 to 86, eight and a half inches, I believe, um, feet, 86 feet, eight and a half inches. Um, your standard 
for that additional height, you know, under, I think it's under section 450-ish, um, basically talks about is the height necessary for the efficient operation of the facility and won't significantly interfere with uh, use of other property. Mr. Hole of uh, Frito-Lay testified at length as to the need for the height for the functioning of the automated storage facility. He testified that a lower height would not only be inefficient, but would require a substantially larger building footprint, which would have the effect of pushing parking and other things on this site closer, farther to the west. Um, we think the proposed height is in keeping with the industri industrial zoning of the property with the existing developed site and the manufacturing facility which is there and with the existing height of the ASRS building. Um, and Mr. Brooks has, test has testified as to his modeling um, and given you his opinion that um, we will be in compliance uh, not only with the equipment that's on the higher portion of the ASRS but all of it. Um, so I would see, and I would also note that the ASRS storage facility does not contain any manufacturing operation. So we think we've demonstrated um, compliance uh, with the ARS height request that's the subject of the special permit and uh, would hope that you would grant that. As to the site plan, as you know, this is an industrial zoning district. Frito-Lay's uh, manufacturing and warehousing use is a use that's permitted as of right. We talked earlier, Attorney Slater also commented where a use is permitted as of right that narrows the scope of the traffic review. Um, but, but I just wanna say we, we've really made significant changes to the plans in response to things that commission members have said the Lake Association has said and members of the public has said, we moved the expanded parking lot location. We're east of the treed area. Um, the gravel drive will remain. Uh, we've downsized that one little pocket of trailer parking. It's gonna be at a lower grade. There's gonna be additional plantings there and the lighting on the employee parking lot has been lowered. Those are all things that were done on the noise you heard from Mr. Brooks about all the, he's done two rounds of testing, October 2020, and again in December after uh, equipment was installed to further mitigate noise on the starch recovery system. That was all an offshoot of the discussions um, that Mr. Geisick had with Mr. Succi of the Lake Association and Mr. Bennett's December letter report documents that that has had a a, a beneficial effect and and I think Mr. Brooks has also indicated that he believes the the plant um, is is currently in compliance with applicable noise standards and will remain in compliance with those um, noise standards um, and I'm going to get to a proposed condition of approval on that to give you further comfort um, on the issue of of sound um, um, and, and I guess I also just wanted to mention, you know, the letter from Mr. Bell and some of the testimony. I think, you know, we're going to propose a condition for some post-construction testing, and, and part of that proposal includes some of the suggestions that were made um, by the by the intervener in in their latest filing. But um, I, I don't believe, you know, in terms of the request for, you know, for modeling, et cetera, you know, in advance, uh, I, I really think that goes beyond the scope of the um, regulations. Uh, I think it would be, you know, that's not even information that we, that we have at this point. But at the end of the day, Mr. Brooks has testified he's going to be involved every step of the way on the selection of the equipment for the manufacturing portion. That hasn't been engineered or selected yet. The ASRS has been, which is why he was able to present that tonight. But he's gonna be involved. He's gonna determine, help them decide what to get, where to put it, how to put it up, whether any type of uh, you know, wall or, or structure um, is, is necessary for that. And um, at the end of the day, it's really the, the sound regulations that control. That's the ultimate 
protection um, for the commission. And again, we're going to propose some follow-up testing, giving it to you. You'll know what the result is. We have every reason and incentive to want to be in compliance and continue in compliance with those noise regulations. And if there isn't compliance, then there are actions that are available to you know require compliance. So that, that would be my thought on that. On, on the third-party engineering review, the outstanding comments, um, again, we think those are all things that can appropriately be handled as a condition of approval. Um, in terms of the environmental interventions that you received, um, just briefly, um, the you know just the the filing of one of those doesn't affect how you handle an application any differently than you normally would. What it really, and, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is the filing of one of those petitions does not expand the jurisdiction of the commission over natural resources that you don't have covered in your regulations. And the, the, the next important thing to keep in mind is that the intervening party has the burden of establishing that it is reasonably likely that there will be unreasonable harm to a natural resource that is both within the scope of the Connecticut Environmental Protection Act and within the jurisdiction of this commission under the particular type of application that you're uh, reviewing. I would also note that a lot of the petition talked about concerns relating to the location of the employee parking lot and going into that treed area to the west of the gravel drive that has been eliminated. Um, I would also, you know, the, the, the allegation is that uh, odor and uh, noise could potentially you know, have an impact on wildlife you know, in the area of the lake. I, I, I also would mention to you that you know, there's been no evidence on that at all. That's something that is, would be very involved and complex and would require expert um, testimony. Um, and um, you know, th there hasn't been anything there. So what does all that mean? If you agree you know, that there hasn't been that showing, then it means that you're basically operating under your normal standard of review and you don't need to consider feasible or prudent alternatives. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do for a, a minute here is I'm going to hand up, if I could, I'm going to hand up a number of things and then I'm going to come back and try to walk you through the conditions, if I could just do that briefly. What I've handed to Ms. Aubrey, um, can, it consists of the draft conditions, which I'd like to review to you, but I would also note that I gave her um, a couple other things. Just w w one of them for both applications is really a summary, you know, consistent with everything I just said about the environmental intervention and, and the way those work. Um, those are, those are uh, summaries on some of those points and, uh, you know, some some authority um, for those points which are you know well established I don't think any of them are controversial and again at the end of the day um, I, I just think the intervener hasn't really pursued those things and I understand that that you know but the noise is is their is their main concern and I've also as part of that submitted a proposed finding um, that says that they have not established the reasonable likelihood of unreasonable harm so I just wanted to wanted to do that to sort of close the the loop on that but now if I could go to the conditions 
The first one, um, you, I think you all have it, but let me just read it for those who don't. Um, the first one goes to noise, and it says, following construction of the plant expansion that is the subject of this site plan application and the completion of installation of associated new manufacturing and rooftop equipment, Frito-Lay shall conduct noise testing at up to three residential properties on the west side of Upper Maple Street through a noise consultant to confirm that the facility is in compliance with noise regulations promulgated by the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection at regulations of Connecticut State Agencies Section 22A-69-1. These locations, the testing locations, are to be determined in consultation with the town engineer. Test results shall be submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission through the Planning and Development Office of the Town of Killingly. That's the condition, and I just wanted to mention to you that the doing the testing at up to three residential properties on the west side of Upper Maple Street, that was a suggestion, <laughs> doing it at properties on the other side of the street was a suggestion made by the uh, Lake Association um, in their filings that we received today and, and were very willing um, to do that you know, in, in response to that suggestion. Happy to work with the town engineer to figure out you know, where those three points um, should be. And again, as I said earlier, those results ultimately are submitted directly to you as a condition of approval. We've got to comply. If we don't, you know, we've got to, we've got to deal with it. But as I said, Mr. Brooks is involved, and uh, he will ensure that there is compliance. Um, there's no desire to have noncompliance, um, but it will fully inform you of where things stand at the completion of construction. The second condition has to do with the uh, construction worker parking, which I think came up at the last hearing, and that one reads as follows. In connection with the construction of the plant expansion that is the subject of this site plan application, contracts with construction subcontractors shall include language requiring all the subcontractors to utilize carpooling measures for their employees traveling to the site during construction to reduce the overall number of vehicles. That's something that I think we actually indicated at the last meeting that we would be willing to do. I think we also indicated we'd be willing to do the noise testing at the last meeting. Um, next has to do with the CLA engineer third party review, the, the items where we're gonna provide more information. That one is as follows. In connection with the Haskell response dated January 14th, 2022, to the CLA engineers review comments dated January 12th, 2022. The additional information which Haskell indicates will be provided in response to CLA review comments 2, 8, 11, 12, 14, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 22 shall be submitted to the town engineer for review prior to the issuance of a building permit. Um, in terms of the cut and fill, uh, I, I guess you know we, we could work with you on a condition, but I guess just preliminarily, I, there was a reference to section 560 of the regulations, which I think might be the natural resource removal regulations. I don't have them in front of me. Um, if they are, my recollection is I, th I thought that there's an exception in those regulations. I thought those regulations are primarily geared towards sand and gravel operations where people are doing that as their principal activity. And I thought that there's an exception in there for removal in the course of an approved construction project. So I'm just posing the question as to whether those regulations apply and whether the cut and fill you know, information is a, you know, is, is a requirement. But with that said, if the commission felt strongly that you wanted to see um, 
you know, the, that, that information and, and some estimate of the number of trucks um, and maybe the, you know, period of time over what those, over which that activity is going to happen, whether it's, you know, three months or whatever, um, you know, it's something that we could certainly supply to you and it's something that we'd certainly be willing to supply to you prior to the issuance of a building permit because we're going to have that information and we're going to need to have that information. Um, on the... Uh, and on the um, buffering condition, again, I'm, I'm just sort of struggling that we've identified the area that was of concern to the chairman and I know that's something that the commission may discuss further but i guess the simplest way i can try to approach that is if we can if, if we can sort of identify what the area is specifically and if you wanted you know to impose a condition that perhaps is along the lines of the applicant shall work with town staff to develop uh, a plan for the installation of additional landscaping you know in that area i think uh, again i think we just need to obviously have some reasonable scope that we can't you know bring in uh, 50 100 foot trees that's obviously not something that can work but if they're fast growing trees as mr uh, quinga referred to earlier you know some combination of things um that are you know a reasonable scope we'd certainly be willing to work with staff uh, to do that um I think those are the, please anybody correct me if I'm wrong, trying to juggle a lot of papers here, but um, uh, I think I've hit on most of the things that would be, at least from what I recall here, possible condition type items. Um, I'd be happy you know, if any of the commission members have any um, questions uh, along those along those lines but I, I do want to stress that on the on the noise or, or sound um, we really think the appropriate condition addresses addresses the post construction and installation that it requires post construction and testing um, I think the, the the earlier part of that having to do with modeling and, and peer review and and so forth um, is not necessary, you know, and again, I think it goes beyond the, the scope of the type of proceeding that we're in, and I think you've, you've got what you need through the testing post-construction. So that, that's what I can think of right now. Again, if you have anything else, I'd be happy to address it, but I guess with that said, I would just one more time say we're comfortable with you closing and understanding that you would then, you know, have an opportunity to go about crafting uh, conditions and taking action. Commissioners? I'm, Comments? I'm okay with that. John? I'm good. John Saratopoulos? I'm good. Matthew? Uh, yeah, as long as we have, you know, I mean, we're going to have time to go over the conditions over the course of the next month. So, okay. But, yeah, these are the conditions that they're expecting us, that they're ex what they've interpreted from all of our comments tonight, which seem pretty thorough to what I, what I said, not to say that not others, but. Brian? Um, I had no comments on that outside of the earth regs. I'd refer the attorney to 560.4 B and C. Um, that's where the language or says the commission may require information, so. Thank you. And, and I'm just gonna, hey. I'm just gonna hand Go up, ahead. just for your file, I'm gonna give um, Ms. Aubrey just a couple of paper copies of Mr. Brooks's presentation that you saw on the screen, just so you've got that.
Um, at this point, I want to know if there's anybody else in the audience that would like to speak to this application. And I assume that means there's nobody there wanting to speak. I don't see any raised hands. Okay, thank you. Any more comments from commissioners at this point? Not at this point for me. Yeah, I'm all set too. Uh, staff? Anything from staff? Uh, um, at this point, it would be up to the commission if they want to, as the attorney suggested, keep the hearing open for those limited items of concern, and that's it. Um, okay, that sounds like a plan. So do we need a special, uh, do, uh, special motion for, to do that, or? First we, need first, we need permission for additional time. You have to ask the, um, I'll let the attorney talk to that. <laughs> uh, you, don't need, uh, you don't need a motion. I think it, if you, the chairman, with the consensus of the commission, uh, were to keep it open for that limited purpose, and you stated that members of the commission could, could question that or narrow that, I don't think you need a motion. But as, uh, as was suggested, Mr. Uh, attorney Hammer, uh, should on behalf of his client consent uh, to the extension of time for the narrow that narrow purpose of persons having an opportunity to present proposed conditions and that that additional information regarding uh, the cut and fill uh, be presented and that be the only material that can be in submitted at the uh, at a continuance of the hearing and there would be no testimony by uh, by experts or other in the, it would basically be lawyer only offering their opinions on what they'd like to see for conditions correct the submittal and the uh, the intervener's attorney agreed that they would she would be consulted okay so does does that mean that we don't officially close the public hearing and we're only verbalizing or having a consensus that we're going to move forward under these pretenses no, the, the hearing would be continued, but for the only the narrow, that narrow purpose. The, the, one, the piece of information that, 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 Mr., that uh, both the chairman and Commissioner Card thought was important for the commission to have regarding the cut and fill, that that, that, that would uh, be presented. And since the hearing is being continued and the intervener requested an opportunity to just present proposed conditions, that she present proposed conditions. So that would be the only thing that would happen, would be conditions could be- And that's consensus, consensus only then? May yeah, you, a motion could be made. There's no reason yeah, you don't may, make a motion. May, may I just- yeah, Mr. Chairman, would it be appropriate at this time to make a motion? May, may I just speak to the time limits just to address that? Go ahead. I, I, by yes, my, sir. By my calculation, I, I, I don't believe, I think the time for completing the public hearing on the special permit will run prior to your next meeting. I think it's on or about January 28th, so I would just note that. And similarly, I think the, uh, the site plan, um, again, I think you might be able to get that to your next meeting, but not beyond. So I just, offer that and again I think that your council and your staff can do their own calculation on those things but I just I, my, my only concern is if you continue everything and we come back in February and you and you hear debate from lawyers on what the conditions should be could we find ourselves in a position where you don't feel you can even make a decision that night at which point that could be very prejudicial to the applicant if if you're if you're gonna feel that you can't make a decision you know i don't know how you would handle that but you will run out of time that's a a reality just under the state statutes and and i and i'm, I'm just a little bit concerned if you wait a you know, if you wait a month to work with your lawyer uh, I, that i think but if it's going to be to have more debate are we going to end up at the same place then that we are tonight attorney hammer just so uh make sure we're on the same page if you can if you st uh, consented to the extension for that narrow purpose and the public hearing closed then that 
the Commission would have 65 days after that point in time to render a decision on the special permit and it uh, and it should not be ruling on the site plan until it rules on the special permit first in agreement wait, wait if you close if you close the special permit tonight you'd have 65 days automatically to act on it so I think what you just sorry I'm sorry attorney Slater if I missed you but I think what you said is even if you close the special permit hearing tonight could you act on it at your next meeting is that nope yeah you missed me sorry uh, I was saying if you if you consented to that narrow to, to, the, to the narrow focus that we just spoke about and meanwhile staff is going to work on getting ready yep that if it was extended to then that the closing of the hearing next month would then would start the 65 day clock ticking for the decision uh, that brings up an interesting issue if you've if you've gone if, if we've already hey, burned no. up we've already burned up all our sorry yeah I just have a question for um, the town attorney so we have two separate applications right the special permit has the public hearing I think we've heard evidence that would allow us to close the public hearing that would still allow the town planning and zoning to hear things on cut and fill, which doesn't have to do with the special permit on the height on the ASRS. So could we not close the public hearing on the special permit and then continue on the site plan review to provide that information at the next meeting? In other words, close the special permit public hearing tonight, even if you don't vote. And I guess to answer your question, Attorney Slater, as you know, you know, there's a certain amount of extensions that the applicant can give. If we tell you that we're not going to, you know, the commission needs to be comfortable, I guess, that they're exceeding the timing. But even if we tell you, um, it just brings up an interesting issue whether you still have 65 days if you've exceeded the underlying period. You know, does it eat into the 65 for the overage? I don't know that I've ever had to deal with that issue but I, I think at the end of the day you know making a decision in February would to me sort of be the last uh, window to, to, <laughs> to sort of to do that you know certainly on the site so plan so I, I would interpret that as a no mr. chairman that you don't have consent so we don't have an extension is what you're saying that's right the, under under the the law when there's an integrated Spe special permit Th there isn't an automatic approval that can happen with a special permit so the deadlines that are given is 30 65 35 65 you should always try to follow them but if you don't there's no consequences to it and uh, with a site plan uh, if it were a site plan by itself that can get approved automatically the two were integrated in this particular application the applicant asked that they be treated together and ordinarily when the two are together then the, you don't have run a risk of an automatic approval of the site plan because the special permit has to be decided first uh, and in this case I don't understand exactly whether they're agreeing with that and not being comfortable that they are uh, then then I think that where are we attorney hammer and staff on the site plan application in and of itself we got a consent uh, to uh, I'm having a hard time hearing everybody sorry, sorry but about that. attorney sorry hammer about that. so I, I thought attorney hammer and I before tonight's meeting were in agreement that because there's a special permit that was going to be ruled on before the site plan that the time for site plan review or special permit would govern the time frames for the decision um, and, and if that's true then as long as the applicant consents even if the applicant has gone beyond the 65 days that, that the statute would ordinarily allow the consent, the applicant could not turn around and then say, aha, I've got an automatic approval. So uh, if he's in agreement uh, that, that, they are, that the special permit needs to be acted on before the site plan and you consent to continue it to next month, that would start the 65-day clock running. If, that's, if we're not perfectly clear about that then then I think that my advice would be different but if we are in agreement on that then the Commission would be safe with your consent to uh, extend it to the to next month okay can I just ask a question if the Commission decided to close the public hearing on the special permit tonight then how how would you approach the the next meeting I guess you know the hearing is is closed at that point right 
Well, the, the, my, my goal is that the public hearing be closed and that you no further information is provided on the site plan or the special permit. If you wanted to continue discussions in the site plan, then the intervener would have an opportunity to do that as well. Uh, so my, I think what's ideal would be to know when we're all done. All right. Exactly so what we're can, done. Can, can I just, Please. again, we really want to work with the commission. So uh, had a chance to, to consult again. If the commission feels strongly that they want to roll the special permit hearing to your February meeting date as well, and then tackle both things together, um, you know, we, we would agree with that but I guess just to my earlier point my concern because you are timing out on the site plan I, I, I don't know you know does it even does it make more sense to just say if anybody's got any more proposed conditions you'd like to see them submitted two weeks in advance of your next meeting so that you're not suddenly wading through new things at, at that meeting and you know up against the wall with a with a time limit yeah, you, you and the uh, and, and counsel for the intervener, I think it makes sense that you could represent to the commission that you'll do that within the next two weeks so that you can have a meaningful opportunity. She indicated that she's had a good working relationship with you working through the conditions. So uh, I, I'd ask her, she, ask her if she would agree that she'd provide those to you within two weeks. It's, I can provide them to the, to the, to the commission within two weeks, I, I would like to have the opportunity to speak with attorney Hammer before then. So I have an idea of if he's going to be adding or changing any of his proposed conditions just so I can match, you know, accordingly. But like I said, our focus really is noise at this point. The conditioners, the conditions would be rather limited. I'd have no trouble submitting it to the commission within two weeks if that is what the commission would like. And vice versa, and because that's to, to attorney Hammer's point, if for the first time everybody's seeing everything at that meeting, it makes it very challenging to be in a position to perhaps make a decision that night. Um, and not that you'd have to, but I, I, so um, does that help attorney Hammer? I, I think it helps and you know, I'm certainly, certainly willing to talk with attorney Miller and you know, whether we can or can't you know, come to some agreement, I think obviously it doesn't have to stop the commission from going ahead and, and making um, a decision. So but I, going back to the, to the timing, yep. um, are, are, are you of the mind, because this will change how I advise the commission, are you of the mind that if that in this situation <coughs> where the two applications were considered together, but there's an agreement that the special permit should be decided before the site plan can be acted on, that the special permit deadline is the deadline for, for which the site plan would have to be acted on as well. So that if the public hearing ended, not that the commission wants to extend it past next meeting, the whole goal I'm sure would be to approve it or deny it next meeting, but that the statutory time frame for decision would be coterminous, meaning there'd be 65 days from the close of the public hearing to rule on each of the applications, or is it your view that they are, that, that the, the site plan has to be acted on before the special permit. That's it. Is that a compli was that a confusing it, it, question? It, it, it's all complicated, I guess. But let, let me try to. Right. Pure, it, we, give you is the there answer. any doubt? Is there any doubt, Attorney Hammer? Just to, to get yep. this uh, all on the record, yep. that if the, if this was continued in the fashion we're talking about tonight, and the public hearing closed next month that the commission would have 65 days after that date to rule on your special per special permit application, or do you think it would be less than that? And, and then are you saying if we have six, if there's 65 days there that the site plan would run with the special permit? Well, I want to make sure that you don't think that the site plan has to be acted on before the sp special permit. Time-wise, you Time -wise. mean, even though practically speaking, I think the special permit needs to be acted on first. Right. Yeah. Um, exactly. Normally, when if, you, if the continuation was normally, they'd have 65 days after the close of the public hearing to rule on it. And granted, you're using more of your time well, to to extend uh, in, in your 65 although, days. Although, again, can I? I don't mean to be. Uh, again, I want to be cooperative, but I, I guess all I, all I can say is, you know, technically speaking, the site plan didn't require. A public hearing as we know you know we we were agreeable to that because it was made sense to let everybody speak on everything all at once 
but you know this the site plan processing statutes just have that straight 65 days from receipt you know and can be extended for another 65 because they're they're not coming off of a hearing so i've you know to be honest with you i i haven't had to look in that but if, are you asking more so for our are you basically asking us to say that to the extent there's a claim of automatic approval if they go beyond february that we're not gonna make it is that well, kind of what you're saying? Uh, I'm, I was going along with the SSM Associates case in those related cases when you've presented a site plan that's got an integrated special permit in it. And granted, I understand that they could deny the site, the, the, the height, and still approve a site plan application in this case. But I was believing that you that these were being treated as they're being integrated for the purposes of the 8-7D and rendering a decision so that you, you, the, the automatic approval doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, apply um, because the special permit has to be acted on first. Yeah, and I, I mean, I've never, I don't know what the answer is to that. I understand what you're saying, you know, and, and I guess I'm just gonna throw out there, um, you know, and again, I don't know that the commission wants to do it, but they could, uh, um, Again, well, they, they could have, I, I, Attorney Hammer and I can work on this between now and the, and the next session. The question is, are, 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 are you, will you agree on the record that the commission is not statutorily required to decide the site plan application before the next meeting? Uh, I, I, I think I can do that. Can I just quickly? Uh, So, so basically, we, we agree. If you, we agree if you're extending that you you know that you don't have to make a decision before your February. I don't know what the date of that meeting is. Twenty second or something. Twenty second. Yeah. Okay. So does that at least get you to a position where you can proceed tonight? You know, and again with the hope that we can wrap it up then. And I, and I guess the other thing is if we're if the two sides have the, I mean, obviously, if we submitted something to you that was agreeable to everybody, that would really be nice. Um, but short of that, um, short of that, if we just submit competing things or we rest on what we already did, um, obviously the commission will decide. But I, I still am, I still am just concerned that, you know, is there even a need for anybody to speak at the next meeting if we're going to submit things in advance? I guess I'll pose that to the to the commission. If they can submit, you know, whatever conditions they want, we can submit, you know, just a repeat of what I gave you tonight in a cleaned up fashion. Um, is it necessary for anybody to talk about? That's it? fair enough, and I'll ask the 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 interveners council is that as well because we, we don't want that to be. A debate it's really going to be you know an opportunity each side gets a, an opportunity to present their proposed conditions as Dr. <laughs> Hammer said it'd be awfully nice if they could agree to something uh, but uh, the would the uh, interveners council confirm that that in terms of testimony next time you will have an opportunity to present proposed conditions um, and to the Commission so they'll they'll receive those from you uh, but that the, the, in terms of any testimony, it, testimony would be limited to the cut and fill uh, information that was requested by uh, some commissioners. Is that acceptable? That's acceptable to us. And I actually wanted you to clarify something. I'm looking through my notes again, and I'm just not quite sure because it, look, it looks like I wrote down two separate things. Am I proposing conditions specifically just to noise? I, I have that written down somewhere, and then we've been talking about it. I think it's more general. That was my understanding well it, the the conditions that well let me let me oh it, uh, attorney hammer if the if if there's not going to be any debate and there's just going to be a submission of proposed uh, conditions is there uh, does does that quell your concerns uh, may I have one more second and then sure. try to conclude this
Yeah, I guess if, if all that you're allowing you know, is submission in writing by the by council of proposed conditions, I guess if you deem it appropriate to allow any proposed conditions beyond noise, you know, we won't object to that. But again, that's with the understanding that there's going to be no argument by council, no testimony, evidence, or anything. And I guess the only new factual material would be us simply presenting, here's what happens to 19,000 cubic yards, X number of trucks, and, and there won't be, you know, there won't be a back and forth, uh, you know, with the intervener on that one either. That's, that's or, correct. Or Attorney. discussion on that one. With the that's interview. correct, Attorney Hammer. So, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, my recommendation based on the agreement on the record uh, that the intervener and the applicant will exchange proposed conditions with one another and will make every effort to work together to propose conditions to the commission. Uh, and when they say one, one another, they'll also share them with staff, of course. Uh, and that at the, the public hearing can be continued. Uh, and the only testimony that will be accepted um, and only one who will be heard, attorneys or otherwise, will be strictly related to the Cottonville information that was requested by, uh, by the chairman and uh, Commissioner Card. And again, that's only the applicant who's presenting on that issue. Uh, in terms of the Cottonville? Yes. Uh, I don't know that there's... So I heard people saying noise also. No, no, we're, no. Well, it's the cut and fill information. It's just if you brought information on the cut and fill, um, I don't know. I'm uncomfortable saying no one would have an opportunity to speak strictly on the cut and fill issue. Um, how that would be part of, of that that the applicant would be able to be conversing with you, and not and then everyone else gets cut out of it. Um, I guess the I commission. Don't, I don't imagine there's going to be any testimony right, unless the commission it. asks questions of the applicant. I guess we could just submit something even in writing, and if you have questions, you ask, and if you don't, that's it. But no. um, it, but but in any event, I guess again, I'm just I, I just don't want I just don't want us to get into you know opening things back up again and getting into a broad back and forth with you know uh, even as to that issue, I guess Attorney Slater, I'm just saying uh, we shouldn't be allowing you know new witnesses and, and and new evidence and so forth at that late date that that's really my point no but the, pu the public should people we cannot it's still going to be an open public hearing on that one issue so if someone has comments regarding the cut and fill information then they can't be denied an opportunity to do right and, and the and, and in addition to the parties consulting just to be clear both intervener and applicant should submit any proposed conditions within two, uh, what, two, two weeks. weeks prior to the meeting date? Two weeks from now. Two weeks from tonight, sorry. Okay, thank that's, you. That's February 1st. We should be submitting it on or before February 1st, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you, and that gives you time. I need to have them in my office by February 1st. <laughs> okay. okay, you got it. All right. Um, okay, if there's anything further, happy to answer it. Otherwise, we appreciate your time and attention tonight. And att Attorney Hammer, just to be clear, everybody keeps saying cut fill. I'm asking you to address Section 560. That's so, 560 of our zoning regulations, our which zoning is regs, under. Yeah. When you look at them, you'll see, again, I, I believe they're applicable, and like I said, 560.4 B and C, but uh, you need to address the regs, please. Did you hear that was 560.4 B and C? Again, those I don't have them in front of me, but those relate to uh, the volume of material to be right. It's under our earth removal removed. and filling. Okay. And, and it talks about operational criteria, et cetera. Just again, if you read those sections, it refers you to the rest of the sections. Now, the commissioner could make a motion to basically echo what I said, or. Um, if it's understood on the record by consensus, I don't think a motion is necessary. I think it was clear sure. enough that we don't need to make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Um, do we have a consensus on this? We'll start with uh, John Saratopoulos on uh, following the guidelines of the town attorney. 
What's that? Do we have a consensus on following the guidelines as presented by the town attorney? I'm going to abstain. <laughs> Matthew? Yes. Verga? Yeah. Brian? Yes. And I say yes also. So it is a consensus with one abstention. So is there anything else for this application at this point? Not at this point, but they do need Thank to have, they do need to have their um, conditions into my office on February 1st. This is a new experience for me after uh, 18 years of <laughs> anyway. It's always a first. All right, people, thank you all. I appreciate your time and efforts. Keith, don't. All right. I'm here. No, we just heard people signing off. We wanted to make sure. Yeah. Well, I'd like to sign off, but. <laughs> we ready then, or? Special permit application 211277, American Storage Centers, LLC, 551 Westcott Road, GIS map 214 by 5, 3.8 acres, general commercial zone, construction of six new buildings, and conversion, conversion of existing building to establish a self storage facility. Someone's here to present this application or speak to it? Yes, there is, Norman. Mr. Tebow, is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, uh, Norm Tebow, Killingly Engineering Associates. Uh, John, could you, could you pull that up for yeah. me? Thank you. In the essence of time, I'll try to make my presentation as brief as possible. Yes, I think so. That that would be it. All right. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Norm Tebow, Killingly Engineering Associates. Uh, I'm here uh, representing American Storage Centers. Uh, 551 Westcott Road. Um, this is the former Byright uh, lumber yard uh, that was there for many years. Uh, currently, the main building uh, that you can kind of see, uh, yeah, kind of centrally located, the square building in orange, uh, is the existing 12,000 square foot building uh, that currently houses uh, American sports centers. Uh, there are a couple of uh, indoor uh, soccer. Uh, fields there where the uh, the owner currently um, uh, does uh, you know different sports facilities I believe there's a bat ca batting cage in there as well uh, the proposal is to uh, construct uh, six new buildings uh, these are your typical mini storage type buildings uh, and they've got uh, anything from uh, 5 by 10 to 10 by 15 uh, units uh, all individually accessible from the outside and um, uh, uh, like a typical for, uh, storage center, uh, these, these uh, units will be uh, leased or rented uh, by people who don't have room to store things uh, in their homes or apartments or perhaps are in between moves, uh, things of that nature. Uh, per your regulations, uh, specifically section 420.2.2Q, uh, uh, this is allowed uh, an allowed use in the general commercial zone. Uh, the property is approximately 3.8 acres and much of the property um, is currently developed. Uh, it, it has uh, uh, some paved surfaces, some compacted gravel surfaces. Uh, per the regulations, uh, we are providing a uh, 25-foot landscape buffer around the perimeter of the site, uh, as well as privacy fencing. Uh, the site it will be a gated access to the site. Uh, typically, the uh, 
uh, renters of these uh, types of uh, uh, storage units uh, will have a little access card to get in. It will be a gated entrance uh, where they, they would have to utilize their card uh, to get in there uh, to um, bring whatever they are storing at this particular facility. Uh, we've got multiple surfaces here in order to uh, uh, alleviate uh, impervious surface. We are allowed up to 75% uh, impervious in this zone by a special permit. Uh, I believe we're around 53% total. The, uh, the uh, green around the site are going to be vegetated areas. And uh, I know it doesn't really differentiate on our, our, our drawing, uh, but uh, there are going to be some uh, surfaces of um, pavement millings, and there'll be also some uh, crushed stone surfaces as well. Uh, in order to minimize the amount of uh, uh, runoff on the site. Uh, as far as drainage goes, uh, we are not proposing any uh, type of uh, drainage structures. Uh, however, we do have, uh, as you can see in the front of the site, both on the right and the left-hand side, uh, we have uh, two infiltration basins. Uh, uh, what's really nice about this site is uh, having done uh, test holes out there for septic systems, uh, it's, it's all gravel. So uh, we've got the opportunity uh, to take any kind of drainage from the site uh, and uh, infiltrate it back into the soils. Uh, for uh, conditions where we might have frozen ground, uh, we do have stand pipes uh, within these, uh, these basins so that, uh, uh, say for instance, uh, uh, in the spring when you've got some, uh, some snow melt and so forth, uh, will uh, be able to infiltrate uh, the water down below the frost level. Uh, uh, that might uh, be in the first one foot or so, uh, which would prevent infiltration. Uh, Dave Capaccione, the town engineer, has reviewed the drainage computations. Uh, he has uh, uh, indicated to me and to town staff that uh, the uh, stormwater uh, design here is in compliance uh, with the town's stormwater regulations as well as the MS4. Uh, regulations uh, that requires uh, uh, minim minimizing uh, runoff from the site. Uh, the perimeter of the site, you know, aside from the landscaping that we're putting in, uh, much of it is, uh, it, they're not developed uh, properties around the perimeter. Uh, they're, they're very heavily wooded, very well vegetated. So aside from the 25 feet of landscaping and, uh, and fencing that we have around the perimeter of the site, uh, there's also substantial buffer uh, wooded buffer around the perimeter of it. Uh, this is a typically a very low uh, impact use um, and uh, many times what happens if, if someone's using the, these units, whether it be um, uh, for interim while they're moving or if they just don't have enough room uh, to store um, materials on, uh, in their own properties, uh, they'll come here usually place the materials or uh, whatever they're storing uh, in one of these units and uh, they won't really access it very often. Uh, <coughs> uh, perhaps when they're leaving or if they need to retrieve something, but uh, uh, we found with uh, uh, facilities of this type, I do have other clients that, that have these types of facilities. Uh, typically during the weekdays, uh, you may have two, three, four cars uh, uh, during the day and on weekends you know, you may have 10 or 12 cars uh, on the weekend. So uh, very, very low impact use, uh, much, much lesser than um, the, uh, the, the former use of the Byright Lumber Center and uh, even, even lesser than the, than the sports center uh, that, uh, you know, during uh, peak times, they do have it, uh, the facility full. The um, uh, Existing building that is currently the, the sports center um, ultimately will be converted to storage as well. Um, that will be a, a, a climate control storage there. The um, other buildings, the the mini storage buildings, are the the only uh, the only power that would go to those uh, is going to be for um, lighting uh, on the on the exterior. Uh, we have specified uh, that it it uh, these are going to be. Um, low impact lighting, dark sky compliant. Uh, there'll be um, sconces essentially on the buildings itself. Uh, we do not have any kind of... Uh, shades, right? Pardon me? 
With shades to make the with, light. With shades, yes, there is a detail on the The plants. dark sky, sky queen here. Dark sky, correct. <laughs> yep, we have, we have specified that. And um, uh, as far as that goes, uh, the total number of units uh, we're looking at here, um, and it really depends on uh, the size of the units. I mean, right now we're showing 10 by 10s, uh, 5 by 10s, 10 by 15s. Um, you know, these, these buildings will be constructed most likely one at a time, and whatever the demand is, um, you know, the, these may be, uh, there may be some larger units as well. There may be some 15 by 15s or 15 by 20s if there's a demand for it. Um, so uh, in the configuration that we've shown here, we've got about 260 units total. Um, some of them as small as 50 square feet, uh, other ones that are as uh, big as 150 square feet. Um, other than that, it, I think it's a, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good use for the site. Um, it, uh, much, much of the site right now is uh, kind of in disarray. There's a lot of uh, material that was left over from the former buy right there uh, that, that will be cleaned up as a result of this. Uh, we'll get some uh, nice landscaping around the site. And um, you know, currently, the way that the site sits, all the stormwater uh, runs uh, essentially uh, left to right, and it just sheet flows to the other property. Uh, by virtue of um, uh, constructing this, we're going to be able to collect and infiltrate the stormwater. And actually, our, our computations uh, show a significant reductions in the amount of stormwater runoff to the adjacent property. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, I think I must be confused about something. I was under the impression that years and years and years ago, there was a drainage hole put down in the center of the parking lot, and the parking lot was sort of bowl-shaped to get the water that was coming there are, in off the slope. There are no drainage structures on the property. So the I've confused it with something else similar. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so um, what, where are the uh, fence lines? Are they right on the property line or the inland on the inside of the buffer strip? I'm, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking for the, the uh, fencing. Yeah, the, fe the, fence line is the, just, the fence line is just inside of the property lines. Along okay, so you, you see the differentiate the between the dark green and the light green? Uh, the okay, I see you. Yep. Yeah, the fence yep. lines along there, and then we have the the landscaping buffer. Uh, okay. Okay. And what what will the landscaping buffer be? Is it a grass strip? Is it wood uh, chips? We, we've got uh, we've got some uh, flowering shrubs. We've got some or ornamental grasses, uh, and uh, and some uh, and some grass and uh, and mulch. Okay, so it's a combination. Yes. And then the rocks. You're showing riprap of some sort, uh, palings. What size are you looking at putting in there the, when you show the tailings? Oh, they'll, they'll be, a, it, it'll basically be a, um, a uh, what's, what's the, a trap rock mix uh, that goes in there. Uh, I do call it, there's a spec on the plan, uh, it's, a DOT, it's a DOT mix. Uh, it'll be three inch minus, uh, typically it's something that's, uh, that's uh, mixed with uh, with a stone dust uh, so that uh, it'll compact a little bit better. Is that kind of coarse for foot traffic? Do you think? Or? No, no, it sh it should be fine. I I don't think uh, I I think it uh, it works pretty well. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of like I said. Uh, typically, the uh, the vehicles will you know pull up to their uh, to their storage unit, uh, unload, and uh, and leave. So it's not like you're going to have a lot of pedestrian traffic throughout the site. Yeah, that would be my concern with, with that. That's rather coarse. <coughs> That's rather coarse. Um, and then uh, in the uh, pools, the yeah. basins. Yeah, what's they're that they're vegetated. They'll be grassed. Okay. Yeah, they're they're rather shallow. Um, the uh, the slopes are are very gradual as well. We've got four to one slopes. Uh, uh, but they're re they're only about two feet deep, so um, not uh, uh, they're going to just look like little depressions in the in the terrain and not like a big hole. So is this going to be a manned facility or is it totally unmanned? It'll be totally unmanned. Okay. 
Except there will, well, there will be, I, I'll take that back, there will be an office because obviously people are going to have to go in there uh, to uh, reserve units uh, when, they're, when they want to go in there. So there, there would be an office for one employee. Can you lay out where the entrance is? I'm having a hard time actually seeing. I see the parking lot. I see what looks like a fence line. Yeah, the uh, the entrance, uh, the, both sides there, you see that that little strip of an island in the front? Yes, uh, yes. The, right, right where the, uh, the that, that'll be the entrance right there where, uh, where the uh, Jonathan okay. is in the, and the egress is out the other side. So, traffic, so that's a gate right there by the building? They're both, they're both gated, correct. We've got gated uh, accesses in both spots. So that'll be a uh, gate with a keypad or something? Correct. And so once you enter, then you have access to the whole area and then you exit the other then side? You, then you exit the other side, correct. And it's an autom automatic exit? Yes. Gate or something? Mm -hmm. Commissioners, any questions? Anybody? Yeah, Mr. Chairman Bryant, so I had the same question on the gates. I still can't quite see them on the plans, but yep. um, so the front parking lot's open, Mr. Tebow, as far as so the build, the main building still staying a recreation. The main facility? building is staying. Well, it eventually it will not be recreation. The uh, eventually it'll be, it will be a, a climate controlled storage in there, uh, as soon as uh, you know possible for that. But uh, the the front parking lot is is going to be utilized uh, for that climate control storage where you know people can come in obviously that there's not going to be um, uh, garage door type openings there uh, there'll be there'll be a main entrance there and uh, people will be able to go into that building to get to the units on the interior okay so that'll be carrying but the rest of it's all gate control you can't get to the back six buildings without passing through a gate correct I don't know. I don't know if Jonathan can zoom in on that a little bit. I could. Uh, I could try. You could try to do that. Well, I mean, so the correct the criteria is it's all fenced in and gate. I just can't see it on the. Yeah. It, 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 here we go. Yeah. So if you pan now. I'm gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> it's slow on on here because I'm hosting the meeting as And then while he's doing that, so I see those arrows on that side. I presume that's meaning one-way traffic. That'll on that be one-way traffic there. Yep, you can see the gate right. Uh, we'll we have a right right at that point right there. That's the that's the gate okay. to get in, and we've got some fencing coming off the edge of the building, uh, and then we have the fencing that runs along the top of the slope uh, where the uh, stormwater basin is. Uh, same thing okay. on the other side. We have fencing coming off the building on the left-hand side. Uh, which comes down, uh, you know, parallel, and we have the ent the um, egress gate right at that point. Yep. Um, so one of my concerns is on that, especially that narrow alleyway on the south side, that 15 footer. Mm -hmm. uh, um, obviously, I understand why you're doing one way traffic because it's fairly narrow. You have the details for the signs. You don't put the locations of the signs on the plan. We but have, I assume they'll be yeah, all the all the locations are shown. We we uh, we hit, we call them. Uh, if you see right at the front, it says uh, provide uh, 12 inch wide painted stop bar and stop sign. Uh, it's actually called for right in the front of the site. We've got. To, oh, are you talking about the site sign itself? Well, on the one way traffic, I didn't. Did one you point out signs there as far as do not enter signs as far as that one way traffic? Yeah, you know what? I I think maybe we we missed that one. Well, we could certainly uh, we could certainly add that to the plans. I mean, you have the details. I assume that's the only place where you have one-way traffic. That is, that's the um, only place, correct? Um, and again, so my question though is on the on the landscaping there. That is that all at grade level with the with the the millings you got there? What's going to stop somebody from kind of driving around if they're if they're blocked because someone's backed into their storage area, blocking that 15 foot area, what's to stop somebody from driving onto the landscape? Well, they're, they're raised beds, they'll, they'll be slightly raised uh, from the edge of the, uh, of the, uh, the millings. How much raised? Uh, that doesn't stop someone from driving on them, they're only raised a foot. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, no, they're not, they won't be a foot. They'll be, uh, they'll be about a six inch uh, bed there. If, uh, 
Uh, one thing I could offer, if it's if it's something that you're concerned about in those particular areas, uh, we could uh, we could certainly add some curbing, if uh, if it makes a lot more sense uh, to to prevent um, either people from backing up onto it or or um, or having uh, the mulch and so forth, you know, flow into those uh, travel ways. What, yeah, what about? I mean no, nope. that, that's an option. I was just thinking if we need to specify bigger types of trees or something, that would be a little bit more of a deterrent for someone hitting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Versus what about green shrubs, but. Brian and Norm, what about putting like bollards in there? Like uh, We have bollards yeah. on the corners of all of the units. You know, no, the, but I mean on it, along the that along the landscape inspection too. So instead of putting curbing, curbing, curbing people drive over, it breaks yeah. up. I, I, I would not recommend ball just from a visual point of view. I think that would not really be okay. aesthetic to the landscaping piece of it. I was wondering if we wanted to do curbing or do something again, a little more hardy or bigger on the landscaping side yeah. to be a deterrent for someone driving yeah. that area. And you I, know, I, they're gonna damage and I am, a tree type yeah, I am showing a uh, curbing. I think that's the one spot where I'm not showing curbing, but if you look along the back of the site and on the right hand side, we do have curbing there. Uh, so, uh, that's that's the one side where um, it, it was eliminated and this is going through a couple of different iterations and you know quite honestly you know the uh, the lack of curbing on that side was just a, a bit of an oversight on our part because we uh, we made a, f a couple of different adjustments here uh, one of them being the landscaping where um, my client was under the impression that we could request a waiver for the 25 foot buffer um, after my conversation with uh, Anne Marie she says no you can't so uh, we, we had to go back and, uh, and um, sort of reassess and uh, lay these things out a little bit differently uh, than what we had originally. So um, the, uh, the curbing on the right hand, on the left hand side, excuse me, uh, doesn't look like it was actually put back into the drawing. So uh, the, other, the other perimeter um, boundaries on the site uh, along the back of the site and the right hand side uh, are actually showing curbing. And I think that's indicated by, uh, you can see that by the contours and, and how they ride the curb a little bit. Right. So with that being said, Dan, wh where, would, where would snow storage be from a, a plowing point of view and so as not ruining the landscaping? Because again, you got fairly narrow alleyways, even the backside's what, 21, 24 feet? Yep. So I'm like, yeah, 24, correct. Yep, that's correct. Um, you don't have a lot of room if they're plowing that alleyway where do they put the big pile of snow they're they're gonna they'll likely have to have it removed from the site they'll they'll plow it plow it to the front parking lot and have it removed uh, and, I, but in reality where are they going to put the snow well in in, <laughs> in in reality there's there's no reason why there's no reason why they can't put it with that with that front stormwater basin is and let it melt in place there it is, that's a that's a pretty good sized area, and, and the big green patch. The yeah. big green patch, yeah. correct. Yeah, but that, that again, you say again, it's still a concern. They're going to plow between those two western units. They're going to go north. Then they got to take that big pile of snow and try to push it all the way to the east. Um, I just I just feel you, you, we need to really think about snow storage on the corners yeah. of this lot somewhere where they're really going to be putting the piles of yeah. snow. Well, this this was a layout that. Um, you know the the manufacturer of these buildings um, actually put forth, and this is this is uh, something that they do quite often. So I know that there's some experience and and how they remove snow from these these uh, these types of uh, properties and these types of developments. So I, I know that they have experience doing it, and um, uh, they they make the recommendations actually of like 20 feet between the buildings. We've actually allowed for 24, um, and we are you know giving them a little bit more opportunity to remove that uh, based upon the layout that they've uh, provided to us. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not arguing between the buildings. I'm arguing at the ends and stuff like that. So that, that that's a concern I have um, mm -hmm. on that. Um, the other question I have is you said the lighting detail was on here. I didn't, did I miss it? Yeah, I think, I think that would be the, uh, the new set of plans that I, that I just brought in, Brian. I apologize for that. Uh, okay. I have, uh, it is on sheet four of the plans. Um, no, it wouldn't be on the one that you have, John. It's the one that Anne Marie has in her hand right now. And lighting is only proposed on the building itself. There's no pole lighting anywhere. I'm sorry. 
there's no pole lighting. It's just built lighting on yeah, the, the building the, itself. The, and is the, it shown yeah. on that new set of plans? There's there's no pole lighting. Yeah, the the uh, the um, um, building mounted lights are shown on the plan. They're they're kind of small, uh, but uh, but they are there, and they're they're called out. And they're going to have coat coverage on the top. So yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they are. <laughs> Yeah. And, and are they motion lights or are they going to be on all the time? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I would uh, think for safety purposes they'd be on all the time, but if it's something that the commission would prefer that they were motion uh, activated, I don't think that would be problematic. It would save them some money. Mm -hmm. It would save them some on electric bills. Sure. Chair, if I may. Yes. So the responsible party listed for ENS is uh, American Storage Centers LLC. Is that the new entity that is taking over this site? So correct. That's, okay. So it, it would just be Mr. Leacher uh, mm -hmm. responsible. Okay. Correct. Um, and then as for the the fencing, I know it says vinyl or chain link with uh, privacy slats. Mm -hmm. um, has there been a decision <coughs> on that? There has not. Okay. I, if I had to guess, I would think he's probably going to go with the chain link okay. with the privacy slats because I think it's a, uh, a little more a cost effective option than the vinyl. Norm, did you say the building lights were going to be on the new proposed storage units as well? Yes. So every building on the plan will have lights? Yes, it will. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Yes, I have a question. Okay, John. Uh, uh, is this going to be uh, completed in one shot, or are you going to... Uh, I thought I heard you say yeah. as need. Yeah, I, I don't believe so. I think they'll... Um, uh, it's, it's my understanding that they'll build a couple of buildings... Uh, and as they start to be leased out, uh, they'll and and they have a little better idea of the sizes of the units uh, that that uh, people are requesting and requiring. Uh, they can make adjustments on the buildings going forward as to how many units they wanted and the sizes of the units uh, on each building. Uh, but they will be they will be constructed one or two at the time and not just one. It's not really cost effective to go out there and build six buildings and hope that everybody rents them out. Uh, it'll be on, on an as-needed basis. They, they do go up very quickly. Uh, these are all pre-manufactured buildings. Um, the uh, um, uh, slabs are put in. Uh, they're, they're concrete slabs that they're built on. And um, uh, once, that the slab, once the slab is poured, um, the company comes in with these buildings. Like I said, they're all pre-manufacturing. It's basically assembling them on site and, and just putting them into place. No, I'm, I got to I got to make this comment mm -hmm. that I work with that three-inch minus a lot. Um, that's that's pretty tough to maintain. That's I, it just seems like it, it, you should have something more workable as a surface. I'm not going to tell you how to design it, but I just know that that's pretty difficult to maintain and to, and to keep it down. You, it, you know, especially if those big rocks tend to jump out when they get caught by something, sure. a, a foot, you, a vehicle tire. Well, could I, how, what if we, what if we utilize then like a, a stone dust mix, mix or something of that nature with that? Uh, Anything that might pack it. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just the surface itself. I, I use it a lot on driveways and mm -hmm. on parking areas and you have to if you leave it like that just especially with the plows it just yeah. never stays there well I have on my on my driveway on my own home I have a I have a, a trap rock mix uh, uh, mixed with with stone dust um, on top yeah right. some workable surface correct. a little finer correct and it works it manageable works, it works exactly really well. that's all I, i'm saying yeah i have it maintained maybe every three to four years so it, it works really well yeah any anything to just make it 
so that you're sure. got some kind of a buffer. Yeah, I have uh, I have no uh, issues with that. If that's something that uh, you're a little more comfortable with and you feel as though it would be a better option here, um, we'd be happy to modify that uh, that specification. I mean, it's a great it's a great base. It's it, you know it's absolutely one of the best. But yeah, as a wearing surface, it's quite quite aggressive. Okay, I'll call it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I just have Any a question. Go ahead. Um, are you talking about what the two of you were just talking about? Were you talking about what was going in between the buildings? Because I believe it was Mr. Capacione, our town engineer, requested that he would like to have the site on, on asphalt because of the size and location of the site, and I thought that's why you did well, your, new, your new drainage calculations. Well, he, he suggested, he, he did not... He, he did not say he would prefer to have it on asphalt. He said, does the commission allow you to use millings? That was, that was his question to me. And I said, I believe I've used them in the past, but um, it's certainly, uh, if, if you would rather you know, see it paved, I, I think millings, quite honestly, provide just as good a surface if they're, if they're put down on the warmer weather and they're compacted well. Um, I think they, they do a pretty nice job. It's up. I guess that's up to the rest of the commission. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, it's susceptible to the elements when you're putting them down. They don't, and then not just that, but when you put them around the radiuses like this, you got to, you know, when they're on the corners, um, where Brian's talking about with the snow plows on that 15 foot edge around the edge, when you put millings down on a sharp wearing surface like that, it rolls right out. It doesn't stay. I, I've, I've, uh, I put down quite a few tons of that, and in a truck situation, and and they ended up tearing it out and having to pave those particular spots because it, yeah. it, it well, doesn't doesn't stay in place. I mean, this this Maybe is a, this is a a pretty low impact uh, use. I get what you're saying. I'm just making my comment. I'm not okay. mandating. I. Right. I just know that it becomes an issue. It could potentially become an issue, at least on the corners, you know. Well, we've got the, you know, we've we've got the issues of of coverage as well. You know, we certainly want to stay below the uh, the 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 impervious surface uh, coverage. I get it for the. No, uh, I get it for the site. I guess we could look at it as an experiment and see how it lasts. Yeah, and you know, and, you know, un unfortunately, because of. Uh, you know the existing conditions on site with the existing building and the existing paved surface you know we we had to make do with what we had uh, for the remaining area and try to uh, try to make it uh, work uh, so that we wouldn't exceed that, that the, the impervious percentage so were you uh, I'm reading like you're putting millings down around the new the existing building now that existing paving and that's around the building now that would all come up yeah it's a mess it's, it, is it okay yeah it's it, it's not even worth uh driving on commissioners any other commissioners got questions just one more on, on the landscaping again so i think i heard i, I can't remember what you said so you got ornamental trees how big are those gonna get uh 10 to 12 feet on the trees and in between is what what are those shrubs in, in what between we have we have uh um, ornamental grasses and those those get pretty big. They'll they'll get five to six feet on those on those grasses. They'll be uh, some of the larger varieties. But the fence is a six foot fence. Yes, it is. And what are the what's the the, the surrounding area is? It's, it's all one neighbor. Yeah, all right? one neighbor. It's it's undeveloped. Uh, there's a house. The the residents of that one neighbor. Um, if you're looking on the left-hand side of the drawing, I'm, I'm looking directionally where that is. I believe that's the east, uh, the um, southern side uh, of the site. Uh, the the existing residence there is several hundred feet from the property boundary. Yep. And is the dark green on your landscape plan existing vegetation? Yes, it is. Okay, so there's existing vegetation up to the property line, then you're enhancing it. Mm -hmm. But you got a fence in between the existing vegetation and your proposed vegetative buffer. Yes. Hello. 
I mean, it's, it's just general comment would be you, you got a vegetative buffer in there, but you, the, it, the fence is going to hide most of it. <laughs> so really what the neighbor's going to see a six foot fence if you only got five foot ornamental grasses on the other side of it. Um, I'm just going by your regulations. It says it has to be fenced. Uh, so well, I understand I, that, but I think the idea, the intent was the vegetative buffer was between the neighbor and the fence. <laughs> Well, then you fence, then, then you can't maintain it if if you've got if you've got the fence on your side and you got the buffer behind it, then then how do you maintain it? So, well, I think it's supposed to just go natural, you know, hiding of the site, twenty five feet to hide the site, right? Correct. So, yeah, doesn't have to be maintained vegetative buffer; it just has to be a vegetative buffer. Well, I think you know we we'd like it to look nice too. Uh, I mean, if you're going to be if you're going to be putting in some. Uh, some nice planting, some some flowering trees, and some and some grasses. Then, um, you know, I think uh, you know putting it between a, a fence that you would see on site and a wood line where no one will ever see it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yep, no, I, I understand both sides, but I'm just in my mind trying to wrap my head around the, the five foot grass, six foot fence. Mm -hmm. so, okay. I still got yeah. a comment on snow storage though. Anything else? Berger? No, I'm fine. Matthew? I'm all set as well. John? Uh, John? I'm good. Hey, uh, anybody from the audience want to speak to this app? I have a question. Um, Can you come up to a microphone, ma'am? Yeah. Up to the podium. And you're going to have to state your name. Hi, my name is Carol Riley. I live in South Killing Lake, just up the hill. Um, we frequently lose power up there. And if you have a gate system that is run by power, are they going to have a generator? Mo most likely not. I think if there's a power outage, uh, I, don't, I don't really see why people are going to feel as though it's going to be an emergency to get to their, their storage Unless facility. They're in there. Well, if they're if they're in there, then <laughs> that's it's a just good, a thought. <laughs> that's a that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> that was just my thought. Yeah, uh, yeah. I quite honestly, that's nothing. <laughs> typically, those have battery backup. Yeah, gates. yeah. Typically, okay. Is that it? Anybody else want to speak? I don't see anybody uh, else raising their hands in the audience. Okay, then. Uh, any questions from anybody else? Staff? Commissioners? This is Joanne. Yes, Joanne. Hi. That lady's name was Carol Kiley? Riley. Riley, I believe. Yeah. Riley? L-E-Y. Starts with an R. I. Oh. Where was she from? What was her address, Anna Mary? I'm from South Killingley. I live on Cook Hill Road. Anna Mary? She lives in South Killingly on Cook Hill Road. Okay. Um, okay. If we're all content, can I have a uh, motion to close the public hearing? I make that motion. Have a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Uh, got two. Might as well have a roll call, I guess. You want to roll call? Joanne, are you going to do a roll call, or do you want me to? No, I just forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Ryan Card. No. Bianca Lawrence. Yes. And John Sarantopoulos. Yes. Matthew Wendor. Yes. And Keith Thurlow. Yes. Okay, and this was motion carries four to one. Okay, and this was just to close the meeting. Close public hearing. Yeah. yeah public hearing, uh, zone map change application twenty one dash twelve seventy eight Douglas Construction. Laurel A Horn applicant and landowner six hundred five Providence Pike GIS map two twenty four lot fourteen one hundred seventy seven acres. And 613 Providence Pike GS map 224 lot 13, four and a half acres. 
Request to change zoning from rural development to general commercial. Okay, um, just one moment before we get started. I just want to remind the chairman that it is approximately 20 minutes to 11. Ms. Aubrey, um, I was actually going Wait. to. I'm sorry, may I, may I was Go ahead. Go ahead. I was go. actually going to begin by saying that I'm here with Mr. Degarian, uh, Vice President of Operations of the Applicant Douglas Construction. We're we're willing to go forward um, tonight, but and we recognize that um, there's a very good number of people sitting behind me here who I, it looks like have waited to uh, speak uh, on this application. Um, but in all, in fairness to everyone, it seems to me, um, I think it would be preferable not to start the hearing at quarter to 11, um, particularly on a night where you've already spent four hours or three hours plus on a, on a very complex, um, contentious matter. Um, and that's not even, and that's only talking about the, uh, the self-storage facility, really. Um, so. Our, uh, our request would be, again, with all respect to everyone who's here, um, if we could continue this to your March meeting. Mr. Degarian is traveling in, on the date of your February meeting. Um, we'll give you the, uh, the extension. Uh, you'd need uh, 30 days or something like that to complete the hearing uh, if you extended it till, till that date. Um, could you talk into the mic? Sure, I'm sorry. Um, is it on? Yeah. Green lights on. Yeah. So, so I can hear you. All right, thank you. So that would be that would be our preference. Again, we're we're ready to go if if, you, if the commission wishes us to go tonight. Um, but I do think it would. I, I can't imagine we're going to be done if we start now before twelve thirty, quarter to one. Um, <clears throat> no, um, I appreciate that. And my only comment is that maybe I, if there's somebody that may not be able to make to the next meeting who would like to speak. Maybe I would allow them the opportunity to speak before we continue, seeing that they've waited also. Somebody in the audience? The, uh, this is this is the applicant, Nicholas Dragarian, Douglas Construction. Uh, the only thing I would say, and I was going to put this in my opening remarks tonight, is that, you know, um, we have taken a lot of time and consideration in preparing this application and, and, and augmenting based on former comments of staff as well as comments of the public. And we've, we've um, while we're, you know, it's certainly the commission's uh, will to ask anybody to come up we do think that it the application is going to be enlightening hopefully to a lot of the public and we've taken a lot of their concerns into consideration so if anybody has a concern we certainly are we want to hear it um, we just we think that a lot of concerns may be um, may be addressed in our in our presentation materials um, that being said like um, uh, like attorney Kerry mentioned you know we're, we are ready to go we just we're, we're kind of just looking to the commission and looking to the public to see which direction they want to move. Mr. S uh, Attorney Slater, can you have a comment to help me? No, Mr. Chairman, I, I think you approached it appropriately. I mean, I, I, I think everybody in the public would be better off hearing the application before uh, they make their comments. And they're asking to be pushed to the March meeting. So if there is someone who's waited all this time and won't be able to make the March meeting, I, I appreciate the chairman's perspective to give them an opportunity to speak, but hopefully everyone will be able to do that, be, be able to do that, so that the whole thing can start clean, fresh, and they make their whole presentation before the public comments. So that would be ideal. It's a waving hand. Um, okay, if, go ahead and go to the podium and make your name and address, please. My name is Kimberly Lemley. I live at 81 Halls Hill Road. I just have a question. If we go to March, can we go first on the agenda? Because we all wasted four hours of our life tonight while you guys all bickered back and forth with free delay. I can't so hear a word, so. We okay. just want to know, if we that. come back in March, can we be first on the agenda? Because we wasted four hours of our life while you guys bickered back and forth to free delay. So we just want a chance for us to speak now since we sat here for nothing. Anne Marie, you have an answer for that? I have no problem putting you first. I know you've all waited here. <laughs> and just for the record, the applicant and the public are in complete alignment on that issue. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are 
No, that, that would be fair because as it stands right now, that is the last thing that we have on our agenda tonight. And so it would be the first thing on next month's agenda, but if they can't be here, that's continued to March, they'll be first in March. Okay. And is everybody else content with that in the audience? No. If, if, you need a, if you need a writing from me. February, we won't. Email time. Correct. February, we will not address this, this issue. Right? No, the applicant is not going to be here. They've just asked to have it extended to March. I'll give you a date. Hold on one second. That would be March 21st. Thank you. I don't, I, I, don't think you that, I, don't, I don't think that's accurate. Oh, no, March 20th. I'm sorry. I was thinking February. My mistake. First day okay. of spring. Mr. Chair, if I may, we have at least one more member of the public that would like to make a comment. Okay. Do you want... Go ahead. Okay, she can't make it to the March meeting. Do you want to put your comments in writing and you can mail them to us and then we can... Oh, she's good. She already has them done. <laughs> okay. You know I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, was that again in March? March. Okay. March. Where the third Monday would be March 21st. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, do, do uh, we need a, a motion at this point for continuance? see it. Yeah. It's not, it, it, whatever your common practice is, Mr. Chairman, if you usually do, that's fine, but otherwise, it, based on what just happened in the record, it can get continued by the chair to that time. Can I have a motion to have a continuance, please? I, I make the motion. I second. Have a second by Verger. Any further discussion? Just to add to the motion that the date is March 21st. Okay, so uh, so be um all in favor say aye 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 opposed None. okay thank you um we now we have to are we going to vote on the uh closed hearing on the what you close the we hearing just, for american storage are you going to be talking about that and deciding that tonight or do you want to yeah, we can put that off, right? Anybody want to put that off, or do you want to? So we're going to make the decision on that one in February. Yeah. yeah. Okay, just just checking. Not tonight. Somebody want to make a motion? No, we don't need a motion, right? Consensus. Yeah. You don't need a motion for that. You close the public hearing. It just sits on your agenda till you pick it up. Okay, thank you. Uh, that will be Tuesday, February twenty second. And Douglas Construction continued. We already did that. Okay, new business. Um, I'm, oh, is Mr. Slater, are we going to end his need for any more of him tonight? I've been thrown out of better places, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to throw you out. I'll let you go it's more on. like releasing him. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if we're not needed, you know, no sense being. Well, by all means, and thanks for indulging me in trying to work it out in the other hearing. Uh, to make sure that we just avoided any appeal issues. So uh, thank you for that, even though it was perceived as the public as some bickering. So we got there. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. I'll see you next month. Okay. <clears throat> New business, site plan review application 22-1279, Richard and Nancy Blake, Jonathan and Sarah Blake, owners. Uh, 20 Woodward Street, GIS map 159, lot 18.5 acres, medium density, detached secondary dwelling unit per section 566.6, site plan review section 470 and others. 26 by 26 residents with a 6 by 26 porch requires demolition of existing 16 by 20 pole barns. Receive and refer review for the staff to whatever. <laughs> so, Anne Marie, I thought we had done this. Did, when we changed the regs for this, I thought that we had a moved it to just staff level so if did we that's move what it to site plan review you moved it to site plan review the way our regs are written site plan review is done through staff however i always bring all site plan reviews to the board and then the board can say you decide if you want to handle it or if you feel it's fine that we can do it at staff level uh does somebody want to make a motion to whatever they want to do <laughs> 
I'll make a motion to receive it and refer it to staff. I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, thank you. Play plan review number 22-1280, Tammy uh, Rainville and Robert LaFonte. Uh, 146 Pineville Road, JS Map 18, Lot 23, 7 Acres Road Development. The detached secondary dwelling unit, 30 by 50 garage, 18 by 47 secondary dwelling unit. Um, uh, can I have a motion for this one? I'll make a, another motion to receive and refer this to staff. I second it. Can I have a second? Second. Second somebody? Yeah, me. Berg of second. Oh, I did. I got to hear you. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. How All right. Second feel? by Verga. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Okay. Adoption of minutes November 15th, November 13th, December 13th, and December 20th. All of those dates, I make a motion to approve them all. Do we have a second? I'll second. John? Yes. John Dapples makes a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? What else we got? We'll discuss the workshops later, next month. Oh, commission uh, dates, you already approved those. Sorry, that was. Just stayed on. That's it. Unless you want to hear reports, nope. or do you want to wait? No. There's uh, somebody's in the uh, the councilman is here. Does she want to say anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Will. <laughs> you're your mic. Um, What's you're that? your mic. Oh, yeah. Your mic's on the floor. And it's on. <laughs> Hang on. I just left it where it was. <laughs> I didn't knock it on the floor. All right, I'll make this very brief. Um, at the um, January 11th town council meeting, um, eight um, people were appointed to boards and commissions or reappointed, two of which were Virga and Brian. Congratulations. Um, the um, Board of Education has decided or approved the use of $100,000 from their non-lapsing funds to fix um, mechanical issues with the elevator at the um, old high school, which is used as the um, for the BOE. Um, the town attorney was appointed. We're going to stay with Halloran and Sage. The uh, Town Council has set a time and date for a planning session, which will be Sunday, January 30th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon at the Town Hall. Public is invited. It will not be televised. And um, Special Town Council approved um, Pullman and Comley to remain as the um, tax sale attorneys. And that is it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, okay, thank you. We have a motion to adjourn? You have yeah. that. Yeah. Second? Oh, second. Okay. Second. second. <laughs> All in favor, aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>